Good afternoon and welcome to the Thursday, March 25th meeting of the Henrico School Board. Board members, the first piece of business this afternoon is to approve Mrs. Ogburn's remote participation. Mrs. Ogburn informed me as required that she is participating remotely today due to being out of state. Is there a motion to approve Mrs. Ogburn's remote participation in today's meeting? So moved. Motion made by Ms. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Reverend Cooper. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Mrs. Ogburn may participate remotely. Board members, you've had the opportunity to review the agenda for today's meeting. Is there a motion to approve our meeting agenda? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Second by Reverend Cooper. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Reverend Cooper. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. The agenda is approved. Now, board members, it is necessary for the board to move into closed, a closed meeting for the discussion of matters covered under items A1 and A2 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended, pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees, the admission and discipline of specific students and a request for release from compulsory attendance. Is there a motion to move into closed session? So moved. A motion made by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Reverend Cooper. Aye. Oh, excuse me. Uh, there is a, a third item that was added that I missed. Thank you, Ms. Watkins. Um, and the third item for closed session is consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel specifically regarding DJ at all versus Himrico County School Board at all, where such consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigation posture of the public body. Do I have a motion on this advised or revised closed session agenda? So moved. Thank you. Uh, motion made by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. We are now in closed session. Is there a motion to certify that only those items detailed in the agenda for closed session were discussed? So moved. Moved by Ms. Kinsella. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Atkins. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Reverend Cooper. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. The closed session has been certified. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. The first item I have is a request to approve the readmission of student case number 19-20-S-5. And as always, the name of the student is protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Is there a motion to approve the readmission of student case number 19-20-S-5? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Mm -hmm. Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. Thank you. For the next item, I'm recommending the board's approval of the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 20-21-CA-02. Is there a motion to approve the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 20-21-CA-02? So moved. Moved by Ms. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. Thank you. For the next item, I'm recommending that the school board approve the appointment of administrative personnel. Is there a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation of an administrative appointment? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? 
Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The recommendation is approved. Thank you, members of the board. You've just approved Marcellus Bland, promoted to associate principal, uh, effective July 1 of this year, where he will serve at Deep Run High School uh, to replace an administrator who will be retiring. All right, for the next item, we have our regular health committee update. So Dr. Teigen is gonna come forward um, and share our update at this time. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I appreciate the opportunity to once again provide an update on the work of the HCPS Health Committee. It's been a busy few weeks with the return of more students to in-person learning. The contact tracing team members have been extremely busy responding to increased reports of students testing positive for COVID-19. But before sharing today's agenda, I would like to thank our parents who have kept their students home after completing the daily self-check and having to answer yes to any question to include a possible exposure. The actions of these families has likely protected others from being exposed and potentially infected. These parents are to be commended. Now here's a look at today's agenda. The agenda today is based on the last two meetings of the health committee. The topics include reviewing current data and baseline data to interpret what, what, it's actually, what it actually means for our schools and sharing the updated guidance from both the CDC and the VDH, and updating the committee members on the status of contact tracing and reviewing what happens um, when a student becomes, I'm sorry, and about contact tracing and some of the information being shared on our dashboard. Discussion of the status of vaccines for both staff and students, and then finalizing the revisions of the HCPS COVID-19 health plan so it reflects our current practices. Let's dive into each of these focus areas, beginning with a look at the most current data and the baselines for the secondary criteria. On March 6th, 2021, the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons within the last seven days was at 116.0. And the percentage of PCR tests that were positive during that same seven day period were 5%. Two weeks later, on March 20th, this is our most current data, the number of new cases per 100,000 has increased slightly to 116.3, while the percent positivity has decreased to 4.6%. Let's take a closer look at the indicators and thresholds for community transmission. The level of community transmission is determined using the two measures from the previous slide. Here's a quick visual of where Henrico County is based on these most recent seven day data that was shown. The total number of new cases per 100,000 um, persons in the past seven days was greater than 100. So th that indicates that our current community transmission is high. The percentage of PCR test was less than 5% over the last seven days. So the, that indicates low transmission. But since the recommendation of the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health is to use the highest of the two indicators to determine the community transition, we say that our community transmission remains high. The CDC also provides secondary indicators to support the decision-making process in local communities. But these secondary indicators should not be used as the main criteria for determining the risk of disease transmission in school. These criteria include the transmission within schools, student absenteeism, and staff capacity. These are not new. Um, what is new is the interpretation of that impact to a school. Transmission within schools, or at least on buses, has increased. We will discuss contact tracing and some of the challenges a little later in the presentation but the number of outbreaks since February has increased to two that are confirmed and two that are pending. We do anticipate the two pending to be converted to outbreaks once they're reviewed by the Virginia Department of Health team. 
And so that makes our level of impact with the transmissions in schools as high. The attendance numbers for students learning in person last week was calculated to create a baseline to be used moving forward. The current overall rate of 92.2% for students in K-12 would indicate a level of low base, baseline at, or low. The average student attendance rate, just so that you know, broken down elementary, middle, and high, at the elementary level was 94.8%. The average attendance for our middle schoolers was 91.0%, and for our high school students was 87.3%. When looking at the staff capacity, on average, well, that would make our overall baseline again low. When looking at the staff capacity on average, there were two teachers absent from each school each day. This would indicate, again, what would we would be considered as normal or low. So let's look at what the combination of the core and secondary indicators combined may suggest. Using the decision matrix shared for the first time two weeks ago, we know the community transmission is high. Using an average of the three secondary indicators, it is expected to see a, minim, a medium impact on schools. Thus, the decision matrix for school reopening recommends that our elementary pre-K through five students should be in person, have as much, the maximum amount of in-person instruction as possible. Secondary, consider temporary hybrid or reduced attendance, which I think of our Wellness Wednesdays. And social distancing, minimum of three to six feet with an attempt to adhere to the six foot social distancing. Um, extracurricular activities and athletics to focus on more outdoors where more distancing is possible. And of course, recommendation of wearing masks, which we have not deviated from. And this is just the continuation, as you recall, if we had to go down into the next, to the high impact to schools. And so, at this time, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Gilbert, and she's going to give us an update on the guidance related to social distancing and into contact tracing. Good afternoon. On Friday, the VDOE communicated that the CDC guidance, which was just adopted by the VDH, now recommends the following with regard to social distancing or physical distancing. Between students and classrooms, the elementary schools, students should be at least three feet apart. In middle schools and high schools, students should be at least three feet apart in areas of low, moderate, or substantial community transmission. In areas of high community transmission, middle and high school students should be six feet apart if cohorting is not possible. Maintaining six feet of distance in the following settings between adults, teachers, and staff, and between adults and students at all times in the school building. Several studies have found that transmission between staff is more common than transmission between students and staff and among students in our schools. When masks cannot be worn, such as when eating, the six foot distancing is required. During activities when increased exhalation occurs, such as singing, shouting, band or sports and exercise, Move these activities outdoors or to large well-ventilated spaces as possible. In common areas such as school lobbies or auditoriums. Our health committee has discussed this new change that the CDC and VDOE has taken, I'm sorry, VDH has taken, and at this time we are recommending that we continue with our six foot social distancing as much as possible. We recognize that there will be times when we lower to the three foot social distancing due to the numbers of students that we have and in um, implementing our mitigating or prevention factors, but we are recommending that the six foot continue due to exposures and contact tracing continuing the six foot 15 minute rule for an exposure case. 
Please see the revised VDH interim guidance for K-12 schools posted today on the VDH website. Um, we have a website that we can get to you all. Um, skip over that, okay. Please note the changes, highlights to the guidance documentation. Um, some of these changes include the word mitigation has now been changed to prevention. Um, these again are minor CDC language changes. CDC now um, generally recommends a three foot of distance between students and six feet of distancing between our adults as we just discussed. CDC recommends that during high transmission that the, the six foot distancing for our middle and high school students be um, enforced. And sports guidance remains consistent with what we have previously had in our Virginia guidance. The remainder of changes are mostly visual and organizational. We have completely changed the decision matrix to be simpler in the presentation to minor CDC format. This should be to mirror CDC's format. We removed level of impact from the table itself and instead covered the concept in words and narrative. This helps make the table easier to read and easier to digest for our users. Testing language has minimal changes as we build out more specific screening guidance awaiting for CDC guidance around um, testing as well as grant guidance. We will add a testing guidance appendix. The close contact definition, as I said, has remained unchanged and will continue to be that six foot for 15 minutes for the purposes of case investigation and contact tracing. A reminder that layered prevention strategies is most important. We are balancing the important goal of getting our kids back into school face to face with the important goal of preventing d disease transmission. To briefly review, contact tracing is done on anyone with a positive COVID test. Anyone being tested or anyone who has been exposed to a positive COVID case. A positive case requires a 10 day isolation period. Exposures are followed and require a possible 14 day quarantine period, which may be extended for household exposures. Air sick or illness process due to the high community transmission remains at a 10 day period unless a release from a physician is obtained. There has been a marked decrease in the number of adult cases that contact tracing is following. We believe this is due to our vaccination efforts and see this as positive and a hopeful step forward. The contact tracing team continues to work with our transportation partners, our athletic departments, and our schools to provide a safe, healthy, and learning environment. These partnerships have included the continued education on these prevention strategies, seating and attendance charts, and the involvement of our nurses on site at our schools for quick responses and questions. New um, data on our dashboard, thanks to Mr. Jenks, for our tracking COVID cases and outbreaks, outbreaks in our schools was highlighted yesterday by Channel 12. They stated the following, we found Henrico Schools has one of the most thorough and easily accessible reporting systems. Henrico Schools daily online dashboard shows the specific school, number of positive cases, number of other people in contact, outbreaks between students and staff, and the date. It also breaks down athletics versus extracurricular activities. Henrico further sends out a message to the entire school community, families, and staff members if there's a positive case. The name of the student or staff member is never revealed in any school district. Again, thanks to Mr. Jinks and his team for their hard work in getting this dashboard set up for us. My team continues to work hard on making sure this data is not only timely, but accurate. Uh, the communication team has this posted and principals share relatively quickly with their communities, that time frame being 24 hours.
We continue to have key central office staff working directly with our emergency operations center and the Virginia Department of Health to schedule vaccinations. Kathy Edwards, our administrative assistant, and a huge shout out to her, has been designated as the individual within HCPS to be able to assess um, the VDH registration system and she schedules air appointments. Over the last two weeks, she has managed to schedule everyone who missed their second dose and she was able to find them appointments within the, within the maximum window of time. She continues to work each day to schedule any new hires wanting to be vaccinated. Again, a huge shout out to Ms. Edwards for all the hard work she has done. The VDH indicated vaccination efforts would likely continue through mid to late June. They want to ensure everyone in the region who wants to be vaccinated is able to do so. The number of vaccines able to be given in a single day continues to increase. We have been successful in achieving over 5,000 doses per day at RIR and have hopes to meet a 10,000 dose day here soon um, in the upcoming weeks. In the health committee meeting this past Monday, there was also discussion around high school students having access to the vaccine. I have been in conversations with the VDH, um, specifically our epidemiologist. Um, they have confirmed that the students 16 years and older with underlying health conditions may sign up for these vaccines, specifically Pfizer, through the VDH website. Um, we are working with the VDH to have their terminology for this to share with their families. These students would qualify as a category 1B. Uh, conditions would include such things as asthma, diabetes, and being overweight or obese. We certainly here in HCPS would not mandate that anyone, staff or student, get vaccinated. Our goal is simply to make sure anyone who is eligible knows that they are eligible and how to access that vaccination. The changes in the HCPS COVID-19 health plan that were recommended by the HCPS Health Committee have been made and the revised plan will be posted on the website and resubmitted to the VDOE by Monday, March 29th. The Health Committee continues to monitor for and discuss updates to practices suggested by both the CDC and VDH. As more and more data becomes available, the recommended actions are likely con to continue to shift. Having key members of the VDH at our weekly Health Committee meeting helps us stay and adjust our course as we would continue to put staff and student safety as our top priority. Dr. Tigan and I are now happy to answer any questions that you may have. And, and if I might just tag on to the end of that presentation and thank you both uh, before we take questions and, and turn it back over to the board. Just wanted to reiterate that while um, you, know, you heard that the health committee's recommendation related to the new CDC guidance uh, that went down to three feet was to remain at six, administration does concur with that recommendation that the health committee brought forward. And so while you'll see some changes that were just described uh, to our health plan that will be reposted, that the changing from six to three is not a change where uh, looking to make now, and that's primarily uh, their recommendation based around the fact that contact tracing guidelines have not changed. They remain six feet for 15 minutes. And so our goal is to remain uh, uh, in in-person instruction and offering that is to as many students as possible, uh, as much as were possible. And so the thought was with levels of transmission as they are now in the contact tracing efforts uh, underway that a reduction uh, to three feet could put us in a position to be contact tracing more students out of school. Uh, than having students remain in school. So that's something we're gonna to continue to monitor on a weekly basis as they look at numbers, but administration does concur with the health committee's recommendation to maintain the um, six feet as possible between students. I appreciate that clarification, Dr. Tigan, and thank you, Ms. Gilbert, for your presentation. Board members, are there any questions or comments at this time? Ms. Atkins? So thank you so much as always. I want to just um, acknowledge um, that we had the passing of nurse uh, Dimple Bassett 
and uh, an extraordinary individual, wonderful nurse at uh, Highland Springs High School. And just want to give my dip deepest sympathy to the family. Uh, she will be missed. And I know that you are working to shift and move nurses around and aides around. And I just think it's important to acknowledge um, the loss and honor her at the same time. And I'll say once a Springer, always a Springer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atkins, Reverend Coover. Thank you so much, Mrs. Um, Shea and, and Ms. Atkins for your comments. Again, again, I reiterate each month the, the um, support and great gratefulness for you, Dr. Tigan, and you, Ms. Gilbert, for your work and the staff as well. Uh, first question, for clarity purposes, could you discuss the role of the school-based COVID-19 liaison? Um, the reason I ask that question, um, if a parent or guardian has a specific COVID-related question um, pertaining to their student school, is the school-based liaison their first point of contact, um, or is there a directory um, listing of the persons, um, and is it accessible to the community? The liaison, the COVID liaison is really the person who interacts with central office on, has on a weekly or even at times more frequent basis to be kept up to date on um, any changes that happen. They're also um, taking care of um, inventory of the PPE in their building. That is a person that um, parents should be able to go to and ask questions but I would also hope that a parent is comfortable being able to ask a principal as well, you know, and, and if, but if not, that liaison definitely has information from meeting each week um, with, with the central office team. So would you say the first contact would be the principal instead of liaison or vice versa? And, you know, is it accessible to the parent um, each, at each school, the liaison's name and information to contact? We can, we can certainly ask our principals to share that liaison name with their community. Sometimes it depends. I think the comfort level, I mean, if they were looking for a highly technical um, question, then they'll probably want to go to the liaison. But I know sometimes there's comfort level with who do you have a relationship with. Right. And if the person in the school cannot answer the question, they can certainly go to the liaison and be able to get back with the parent and answer them as well. So I think relationships are important. Cool. and. Um, but they certainly may go to the liaison I and we'll make it. sure that's communicated. Yeah, I just want you know, for clarity purposes, like I said, just, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the hierarchy or rather the, um, the, the best, best person to contact first. And the second question, as you know, we look at um, the guidelines changing from the CDC, but we, you know, justifiably have, you know, decided not to acquiesce to those guidelines, but kind of stay where we are because of contract tracing. I understand that. The question I raise is um, what's some of the feedback um, that you're hearing from our teachers and, and building staff on the students and staff's compliance with the six foot social distancing and as well as feedback from the bus drivers. I'm just interested to hear. You know, the, I think the biggest um, feedback we've gotten from adults, whether they're teachers in buildings or our bus drivers, are the, that the students are compliant. Um, they've been really pleased with how, you know, they're sitting like on the buses, they sit in their assigned seats there, they continue to wear their masks, they're not having um, concerns there, which I think was what they had concerns about before, even though we knew from neighboring counties that had come back that that had not been an issue there and didn't anticipate it being an issue. Um, you know, as far as, you know, inside the buildings, I mean, they have things labeled and seats set out that it's really hard not to have social distancing. Um, you know, walking through the hallways, I think is probably one of the greatest challenges when they're, you know, like going to a restroom or something and, and maintaining that six foot distancing. But the floors are marked to help with that. Um, it's good to hear the feedback in regards to the compliance. I appreciate that. And then last question for me, um, at the Board of Supervisors meeting last week, um, there was mention that because the Richmond Raceway has not been designated by the state uh, as a community vaccination center, this impacts its eligibility uh, to receive more of the weekly doses of the vaccine from the state. And the question I raise is, uh, what impact do you foresee this having on our efforts to ensure that all eligible HCPS staff who want to receive vaccine can actually get vaccinated? 
Um, I think that the impact should be minimal on Henrico County Public Schools because we, you know, our staff, our teachers were prioritized by the county in the very beginning when they were when they could first offer to the 1B category. And, you know, as of tomorrow, I think every one of our staff that was previously um, immunized, that they had the first injection, will have had their second. Now, we're still having people that new hires that come in or people who opted not to have the vaccine are now deciding that they might want it, but it's not the masses. We have probably 75% of our staff um, of any all categories that have been um, immunized. So that we're well above the average on the number that have been immunized. That's very I think we're in great shape. Sure. Well, it, it will you. impact the community. Well, thank you, Dr. Tigan. Uh, Ms. Gilbert, Ms. Shea. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Ogburn, do you have any questions or comments? Trying to give a few minutes for the delay. No, I don't. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Kintella. Um, I continue to, to appreciate the work that um, both of you are doing and your teams are doing. Um, have, if, if you could just uh, maybe explain how contact tracing works, especially if it's, um, it happens outside of school that differs from the guidance that we share with families? Well, um, you wanna go ahead? I mean. So con contact tracing in the community is done primarily by um, Richmond Henrico Health Department. We support them by contact tracing here for our schools, our school staff, and our students. So when an exposure or positive occurs in the community, we certainly rely on our families to be transparent as we are with them. So if a family is transparent and lets us know that their child has had an exposure or staff member does the same, then we put them into that contact tracing um, mode or pathway. Um, and again, exposures are held to a 14-day quarantine um, that starts at the time of their um, last um, contact with that positive case. Um, it uh, can be affected by if it's a household um, person that they're in contact with because that contact would continue to occur day to day. So that 14 days may be lengthened. Um, same with their positive cases. If a positive case is reported, either student or staff member, uh, we put them into the pathway and positive cases are isolated for uh, 10 days. Um, we are holding to the 14 day for quarantine on exposures. That is what our epidemiologist at Richmond Henrico Health Department considers to be um, like the gold standard. Um, it allows us to be consistent across the county with both staff and students. Um, there are other guidelines that can be followed according to Richmond Henrico or BDH and CDC. Um, they require testing, monitoring of when that test occurs, what type of test it is. And as you know, we can't require staff or students to disclose mm -hmm. that information. So in discussions with the health committee, with Richmond Henrico Health District and our epidemiologist, the recommendation would be that we continue to do the 14 day quarantine for anyone who is exposed to a positive case. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that once again um, with whoever may be listening or watching. Yes, ma'am. Um, because we continue to receive um, feedback in, in numerous ways, this will be for Dr. Tigan or Dr. Cashwell, regarding Wellness, Wednesday, Wellness Wednesdays. There are students um, who support keeping it for all the reasons that we've named at prior meetings. There's uh, staff that have, uh, we see the value for staff to have this time for planning as well as to work with students uh, to, to enrich or remediate as necessary. Um, some advocacy came in uh, requesting for consideration, would there be any expansion of pre-K to two? on Wellness Wednesday from now till year end. And I just wanna bring that forward um, and, and ask for consideration or, or how, we, how um, the team feels about that. 
and just to make sure I understand the advocacy is to perhaps discontinue wellness Wednesday for select groups of our youngest learners. Yes, and for so those who we, it's most challenging, perhaps pre-K to two or to have some kind of expansion on wellness Wednesday. Certainly, I think, you know, one of the um, challenges we still uh, face is the number of virtual pre-K through <laughs> two students is still greater than the number in person. And so, you know, trying to make sure again that we're serving those in-person and virtual learners well, that Wednesday is really an opportunity for student uh, teachers who um, can remediate more with the face-to-face -face students Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday to have some one-on-one -on -one remediation time via the Wellness Wednesday. But we continue to look at ways to maximize that time um, and make sure that we're meeting student needs. But certainly we'll take that into account as we continue to reflect on how we can best meet student needs. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Um, I have a few questions of my own. Um, Dr. Tigan, when you um, had the um, 92.2% baseline for attendance. Is that just of in-person students or does that include virtual students? Just in-person students. Fantastic. Thank you. And then, you know, we talked about um, we have two outbreaks confirmed and two outbreaks pending. And you also mentioned in the sentence before that um, trans Transmission is on buses. So um, are those outbreaks tied to bus transmission? Do we know? Uh, okay. uh, three of the cases are tied to buses. One of the cases is a classroom. Thank you. All right. Um, and then I know this has, y'all have already said this and uh, Ms. Gilbert articulated it so clearly, but I want to ask you to articulate it one more time because as soon as that CDC guidance came out on Friday, um, my inbox started filling up um, very quickly. And so um, can you articulate for us um, one more time um, why we are not choosing to change our, um, our, so our distancing? You know, a large part of that is what we're seeing on the buses with the three foot social distancing that's creating more contacts and putting more students out that, you know, if we reduce those spaces even more in um, classrooms that then there'll be more, you know, the potential for higher numbers of contacts and the contact tracing which means kids are out of school. And so we're trying to maximize the amount of time that our kids are in school and, you know, um, so that's, that's been a main priority. And we know, too, that our families, you know, chose to send their children back knowing what the distance would be. And so, you know, just the overall consensus of the committee was that stay at six feet. We're still at high transmission. Let's continue to monitor. And, you know, that's a conversation that we'll continue at the health committee meetings. But... As of now, it was to stay at the six foot social distancing. Ms. Shea, if I may put some perspective on it. If we have a positive case right now and we're at six foot social distancing or six foot, um, six foot distancing in the school rooms or on the bus, we put one child out, that one positive case. Anytime we lower that distance to less than six foot, it becomes multiple children that are sitting within that, within that six foot distance. And we have found that that is usually somewhere on the line of eight children. Um, so instead of putting one child out of face-to-face -face for 10 days, we put one out for 10 days and another eight children out for 14. So if we can keep that six foot distancing, we have more face-to-face -face instruction for our students. I think that's important context you add. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. And then just to further clarify, a lot of the emails I've gotten about it um, are from secondary parents. And even, you are not recommending to adapt the CDC, but even if you were recommending, which you're not, but even if you were recommending, we're in high transmission. Right. And so that would not impact secondary. Correct. It, it would still need to be six feet with the community transmission we have. Yes, ma'am. I think, I think that's an important detail um, that many of the news articles that give the updated bulletins don't get into that level of detail. So I appreciate that. Um, and that is all I have. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much to uh, the entire health committee, our presenters and the board for your excellent questions.
The next series of items I have for the board are review, um, our policy reviews uh, that are coming forward. This is a first look at a, a large number of policies uh, for which I'll be seeking your approval at a subsequent board meeting. And so simply offer an opportunity to answer any questions you might have about the material that's been submitted uh, through board docs related to the review uh, for revisions. I wanna once again thank our policy committee. I know we have board members serving on that committee. You can see by the extensive lists that are coming forward this is a um, you know just a large task to make sure that our policies are reviewed they're up to date and reflect practice and this this uh, policy committee along with a large number of staff uh, members who have given input have brought us to the place where we're able to continue to, to bring forward revisions so any questions related to the review uh, of re proposed revisions to policy p6-03-001 Board members, any questions or comments? None. Uh, any questions uh, related to proposed revisions to policy P6-03-006? Questions or comments? All right. Okay, any questions related to proposed revisions to policy P6-03-012? Nope. Okay. Any questions to the revisions to policy P6-04-002? Nope. Okay, questions for proposed revisions to policy P6-04-006? Nope. Okay, any questions related to proposed revisions to policy P6-06? Nope. All right. Uh, questions related to proposed revisions to policy P6-06-007. Nope. Okay. Also want to offer an opportunity for questions to policy, uh, revisions to policy P6-07. Nope. Proposed revisions to policy P6-09-004. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, Ms. Atkins. Question. <laughs> uh, but in this particular uh, policy, I was wondering if there was any discussion on uh, the piece. I'll just read it here. Uh, if a student requires treatment beyond first aid or and if the parent or legal guardian cannot be reached and the situation is deemed potentially life-threatening, 911 will be initiated. I wonder if there was any conversation on replacing 911 with a little bit of clearer language and say emergency assistance or emergency services. Was there any thought on that? Uh, you know, I can bring that back to the policy committee and we can um, let you know before our next uh, meeting, before we seek approval. Thank I've you. I've taken note of that. Were there other questions about that one? All right, next one, um, any questions related to revisions to policy P6-09-009? No, ma'am. Questions? Well, nope, was there one? Okay, P, uh, for P6-10-002. Any questions to policy P6-11-002? Nope. Okay. Any questions related to policy revisions to P6-13-005? Nope. Any for policy P6-18-010? I have one if, if my colleagues don't. Okay. Um, when I looked at the details of this, this is the expunging records. Um, when it's listed at the top under section A of um, A5, it says test scores, those required by the state. Those are things that are to be kept for 75 years. And then section B are things that can be expunged after five years. And on B7, it says test scores, profiles and inventories. Um, and then the word not got scratched out. So it would then read test scores 
profiles and inventories required by the state. And that seems to conflict um, section A5. So I just wanted to bring that, and I may be misunderstanding. We'll bring that uh, feedback back to the committee and make sure we clarify before uh, I seek your approval on that revision. Thank you. Any other questions? Other items related to expunging records? Okay. Uh, moving right along, Re uh, any questions to the revisions to policy P10-07-001? Nope. Okay. Questions to revisions, uh, questions about revisions to policy P10-08-005? No, ma'am. Okay, and the next one is actually um, slightly unusual in that it's a review of multiple policies which are actually unchanged. And so uh, the requirement is that policies be reviewed and then approved again, uh, given a certain window of time. And so these policies are up for review and reapproval, but we're not seeking any changes to P605001 attendance, P608009 high school equivalency exams, P609. 006 emergency drills, P609015 missing children, P610003 use of bicycles. So they're there uh, for your re review. Um, I'll seek your approval on those at the next meeting, but I'm not seeking to make any changes. Any questions about those? Dr. Cashel, I'd like to um, specify for the public hearing. I know we went through a lot of those very quickly without talking about what the changes are, but a lot of the policy changes are um, changing words, it's, you know, wording updates, but all of these are listed um, in board docs, but they'll also be available for review on the webpage, correct? That's correct. They're uh, available for public review uh, subsequent to my seeking your approval at our next meeting. Thank you so much. All right, thank you members of the board. The next item I have is um, I am seeking your acceptance of the Chick-fil-A Leader Academy micro grant of $500 to Freeman High School. Is there a motion to accept the micro grant that benefits Freeman High School? So moved. Moved by Ms. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Reverend Cooper, roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The grant is accepted. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board accept the grant award of $500 to Johnson Elementary School from Richmond Area Reading Chapter of the Virginia State Reading Association. Is there a motion to accept the grant that benefits Johnson Elementary School? So moved. So moved by Ms. Kinsella. Um, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Atkins. Roll call vote, Ms. Atkins. Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The grant is accepted. Thank you, board members. For the next item, we are bringing forth um, a review, an update for our school board on the Henrico County Public Schools participation in the International Baccalaureate Program, or IB program. And Mr. Dusalt is coming forward to tee that presentation up for us. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. My name is Michael Dusalt. I am the Director of Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. With me this afternoon is Ms. April Craver, IB Specialist. Together we'll present to the board an overview of the International Baccalaureate Programs in Henrico County Public Schools. We are excited to be here today to give you an update on IB in Henrico. Current data are 2020 IB evaluation and the next steps to grow the program. So where does our work begin? Like any good plan, we begin with the end in mind. Destination 2025 outlines what outcomes drive our IB workflow and set the stage for the big picture planning. Let's dive into our roadmap to destination 2025. We'll start with a general overview of what the IB programs and opportunities we currently offer in Henrico County Schools looks like.
Na gut. If you might, uh, right. I think we may try that. Our technical difficulties. One I think we're going to have to pause that and try it one more time to see if we can have a sound that we'll uh, be able to hear better. Um, if not, you can give us a recap of the content and we can uh, attempt another way. So, all right, we'll give it one more shot here. See if our volume will cooperate. No, we'll pause a moment and see if we can get some technical assistance on volume. If not, we will push on. Is there a way to increase the volume there? Okay, we've got someone coming forward. We'll give it a shot, and if not, we'll um, thank you for your patience. I apologize. County has had the IV program for 25 years, actually more than that at this point. And with all of that experience, one of the things that we've learned and IV itself has come to know is that this is good for every child. IV in and of itself has IV profiles. Um, are they caring? Are they knowledgeable? Are they inquirer? So all things that make a learner a good learner are part of the IV profiles that they can identify with. You're trying to help the child to become better at being a communicator and trying to help the child to meet his or her social emotional needs. You are trying to really meet the child's needs, not just in terms of academics, but the things outside of school. I'm not the type of learner that's like, hold my hand the whole way and you know, like just give me all the answers. I like to be able to figure out things on my own. I give them the tools and they get to kind of guide themselves. I'm able to ask my teacher, can I try this instead of doing it the exact same way that you're doing it? And so students that, you know, tend to be more hands-on, we can do it this way. Students that want to do it, you know, verbally or traditional writing assignment, we can do it that way. I feel like it usually it makes them, like, reach a higher level than what they really expected to, to reach because they're interested in it. And you can really dive deeper into how things actually happened in history. It's really important for us as new learners and, and older learners to, to figure out where we fit in that, in that global sphere. And it's really interesting to be able to take that extra step into every unit that we have. We try to look at the global context of things historically. You know, how does this fit into the puzzle of um, not just our history, but the history of other places. You can't have an international presence and everybody look alike. Everybody thinks alike. Everybody is from the same upbringing. IB is a collective and it should not be the same. Any child could drive an IB. The way it is taught and the way the students learn and the way they learn to be learners, anyone can drive an IB. When you're a part of IB, you are a part of something much bigger. It's not just here in our middle schools and high schools of Henrico County. It's not just the I-95 corridor. It's the whole country. It's the whole world. And it's really cool to think that there are kids out there, like halfway across the world, learning the same curriculum as you. So we appreciate your patience so you had a chance to see our dynamic IB students and their fantastic teachers. IB in Henrico County Public Schools began in 1995 with a small group of trailblazers at Moody Middle School and Henrico High School. It grew quickly in popularity, which resulted in the expansion of seats available at the original sites and eventually to two additional middle schools, Fairfield and Tuckahoe, and one more high school, Tucker, in 2010. The expansion nearly doubled the number of students in Henrico County Public School IB programs. We now serve more than 1,800 students a year. We currently offer two IB programs through an application process each fall, the IB Middle Years Program and the IB Diploma Program. We're very excited to share that we are in the final stages of authorization to add the IB Career Related Program at Henrico High School. We are currently awaiting our full authorization visit and notification of acceptance into the World IB Organization this spring. The International Baccalaureate aims to develop inquiring, 
knowledgeable, and caring young people who help to create a better and more peaceful world through inter intercultural understanding and respect. IB works with schools, governments, and international organizations to develop challenging educational programs and rigorous assessments. These programs encourage students across the world to become active, compassionate, lifelong learners who understand that other people with their differences can also be right. If this sounds similar to the knowledge, skills, and attributes contained within the Henrico Learner Profile, you'd be absolutely correct. If you were to crosswalk the IB principles with that of our very own Henrico Learner Profile, you would end up with the same overall goals and objectives, students who make a difference in the world they live in. The student-centered, concept-driven curriculum nurtures the whole child intellectually, physically, socially, and emotionally. In their quest for knowledge, IB students have opportunities for deeper learning, as well as a wide range of topics. Unique courses are designed for each program level, such as the MYP design, DP theory of knowledge, and the CP personal and professional skills. Students often share how far beyond the basics they are able to take their learning in IB. Only IB authorized schools are allowed to be in the IB World Schools and provide the curriculum to their students. Once authorized, the schools must continue to meet IB's high standards, which they determine by the work we send for monitoring and moderation, the students' success rates on IB exams, and the program's official self-study and evaluation, which takes place every few years for each program. Let's take a closer look at the middle years program. The MYP is a five-year program for students in grades six through 10, and is strategically designed for adolescent needs, tapping into their sense of wonder and curiosity through inquiry-based units by exploring globally significant ideas and issues in their eight subject areas, students increase their understanding of the world. They are empowered to own their learning and take risks, explore new ideas and innovative strategies. The diploma program is a two-year program designed for 17 to 19-year-olds, offering them an in-depth independence of college-level studies while IB-structured supports are still in place for high school. Every student takes a full set of ID P courses in sciences, math, language, literature, language acquisition, individual and societies, the arts, and most of which are a two-year sequence. Each course includes internally developed assessments in accordance with the IB's requirements, as well as a series of end-of-course IB-designed external examinations. Student performance over the two years on the exams determine their achievement of the internationally recognized IB diploma. Once authorized this spring, Henrico High School will offer IB's newest curriculum in Henrico, the Career Related Program. The CP is developed specifically for students who wish to engage in career related learning while gaining transferable lifelong skills. It combines the rigor of the diploma program with the student's interests and an IB-approved career-related study. So in order for us to understand where we are and where we'd like to go, let's take a closer look at the IB data in Henrico. If it appears we are gauging our success through the lens of equity, you would be correct. Earlier this year, our DARE department shared an update on the strategic plan and presented this equity index in relation to our students taking advanced coursework in IB. While IB only makes up a portion of this equation with regards to advanced coursework, we have a number of demographic groups that are still below our target line. We still have work to do in order to ensure we are broadening access to more students throughout our IB programs. Henrico's three IB World Middle Schools serve students joining the program from our 46 elementary schools, including applicants within their natural feeder patterns. We accept a total of 425 rising sixth graders by application annually, 
and their IB placement is determined by their current elementary zone in which each student resides. The number of IB seats available at each of these schools is based on its enrollment capacity, which also influences the number of elementary schools outside the neighborhood feeder pattern that come to that middle school for IB purposes. IB programs at Tucker and Henrico follow the same process for applications to the county's specialty centers. Now, like the specialty centers, students are not zoned to attend one or the other IB high school based on their residency. Instead, students can choose to apply to either IB school or to both of them. Those who apply to both schools will receive a separate site-specific admissions results from each school. As the previous slides indicated, Moody Middle School and Henrico High School have at least twice as many seats for IB applicants as their counterparts. As the pioneers of IB and the only IB schools in the division for 15 years, they had to build capacity to host every IB student across the county. They started small, but their seats increased over time to meet the demand. Continued growth in the county's population and success of the IB program generated continued interest to more applicants. Nine new elementary schools were built between 1995 and 2010. To meet those needs, Henrico worked with the IB World Organization to authorize two additional middle schools and one high school. The county factored in residential proximity, transportation, building capacity, to determine how students would be zoned to the three middle schools. The IB World Organization evaluates its member schools every five years to ensure the standards and practices of the programs are being maintained. It involves an 18-month self-study process at the school level, which culminates in a three-day visit by certified members of the IB Educators Network. Henrico had representation from teachers, administrators, central staff, and school board members and students. In November and December of 2020, Henrico IB hosted our first ever virtual evaluation team visit. The IB is aware that for each school, the implementation of the program is a journey that the school will meet these standards and practices to varying degrees along the way. However, it is expected that the school make a commitment towards meeting all standards, practices, and program requirements, and strives to continually improve the quality of their program implementation. Our IB programs received praise in multiple facets of learning experiences, such as widening access to the IB curriculum at Henrico High in the career-related program. We also received accolades for our faculty who are dedicated to tailoring learning experiences to students' needs and interests to ensure they are authentic, student-owned, and community-oriented. The IB evaluation team noted commitment and involvement of our school counselors, librarians, coordinators of assessment, remediation, to grow student success through an attentive and comprehensive support network. Community is at the heart of IB programs in Henrico, and stakeholder interviews painted a clear picture of the strong communication between the IB coordinators, teachers, students, and parents. Systems are in place to keep the governing body informed about the development of IB. The various school board members, central staff, as well as school's leadership are committed to an IB structure that supports all aspects of implementation within the program. In the area of ongoing professional development and collaboration, the evaluation the evaluation team noted inconsistencies in some teachers' understandings of how to use the IB global context, objectives, and assessment criteria in the units of inquiry. To empower teachers through a shared understanding of the MYP philosophy, IB recommended continued professional development, further developing the core elements of IB in their units of inquiry, including ass assessment design and standardization of assessment expectations. The team also recommended 
teachers translate their learning into the design of the written taught and test, test assessed curriculum through inquiry-based IB unit planners, which in some cases reflected inconsistent understandings of some of our core elements and expectations. And finally, the evaluation team noted that the middle years program is currently offered to a cohort or a small portion of the school community. The team highly recommends investigating opportunities to include the broadest possible range of students in the middle years program. So how will the IB department take on the recommendations from the 2020 evaluation report and put them into actionable steps forward? Well, let's start with reviewing our actions moving forward that our IB staff, coordinators, administrators, and central staff plan on supporting to achieve our goals. As mentioned in the evaluation recommendations, relevant and ongoing professional development is key to implementing our programs successfully. In an effort to further our IB principles into practice, developing an IB-infused annual PD plan for each school is our first immediate action. The alignment of professional learning plans amongst all our IB schools will ensure a consistent approach to supporting core IB elements. Secondly, we'll focus on fidelity within our curriculum unit design, incorporation of student needs in order to learn the content, opportunities for service and action beyond the classroom. Support and development for the review of these units with targeted feedback will strengthen our partnerships across the district. We believe that each step we take in the growth of our IB programs must be done with an intentional focus on providing rigorous opportunities for the greatest amount of students. And we believe these opportunities can be accomplished through a variety of actions. First, Henrico High School will complete the journey for full authorization as a career-related program. Secondly, we'll address the number of seats through a redistribution process to ensure a balance of opportunities for students feeding into the Fairfield, Moody, and Tuckahoe IB programs. And third, Tucker will maximize their brand new learning facility by utilizing the new spaces to foster collaboration across programs and content areas within the building. And finally, our fourth recommendation. We look to complete the full IB world journey by supporting our three middle years programs at Fairfield, Tuckahoe, and Moody to a move towards a whole school program. By broadening access to all students attending these zone schools, we would be leveraging the current authorized program status to give additional rigorous opportunities to more students. The 2021-22 20, the school year will be an important planning year for IB and Henrico. During this window of time, we'll be connecting with our teachers, our parents, and most importantly, the students, to ensure that all stakeholders understand how the IB principles and opportunities will impact their educational journey, starting with that rising class in 2022-23. We understand that a shift of this magnitude should not be rushed. To ensure a systematic change in our programming, we will be getting feedback from our current administrators, coordinators, and district leadership. We believe that a phased rollout of incoming class cohorts is important to ensure we're able to strike a balance between professional learning and change. Let's take a closer look at what our draft timeline looks like for this exciting opportunity. Our plan includes the first onboarding class in 2022-23 when we welcome the sixth grade group. In each subsequent year, we would bring on the next class until we get to 2024-25, when all our IB middle school students at those three particular schools would have the opportunity for full IB status. We believe this plan allows for the greatest flexibility with cost, professional learning, and staffing changes that may be required to meet the needs of our learners. It also gives us the ability to carefully monitor any shifts in potential redistricting to ensure we are not consistently 
adjusting seats. A move towards a whole school IB helps support bring together a cohesive culture and climate with each building. So to sum up, expansion of the IB program at our three identified middle schools will not take any services away from our current or future IB students. Instead, we're looking at this plan in broader terms as growing the pie. This plan will allow more students zoned to those schools to have an opportunity to participate into the added benefits that come with IB instructional principles. So where do we go from here? We'll conclude our presentation where we started, Connections to Destination 2025. As we focus towards the goal, we want to carefully review our IB application criteria to ensure it's aligned with other specialty centers, to make sure that it's an equitable opportunity for all students looking for that challenging learning experience. Like any of our specialty centers and programs, a thorough review of admissions and selection processes are a logical next step for the IB programs in Henrico. Addressing, reviewing recommendations from our newly released 2020 IB evaluation report. Our department will continue to refine how we merge IB principles into our own framework within our five authorized IB schools. Fidelity across our programs within the curricular experiences will move us to the next level of systematic review, feedback cycle, and support for our staff pulling together teams to level set expectations and move forward with the application and the recommendations from the 2020 evaluation will result in our targeted professional learning opportunities throughout this summer and into the fall. As indicated, our talented, hardworking team of IB teachers and leaders will no doubt continue to shine brightly as we take the next steps in our journey. At this time, we'd be glad to entertain any questions or comments from our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Dussault. I'll start to my left, uh, Ms. Atkins. Do you have any thank questions you, or comments? I do, thank you, Ms. Shea. I know that, uh, and thank you for your presentation. It was well done and easy to, to digest. It was aesthetically pleasing to the eye, so I just wanted to give you that feedback. Uh, I know that as part of your action plan, that clear and consistent uh, communication is a top priority. I would love to learn more about the communication timeline and plan as that becomes more defined uh, and available. Uh, please share that with me. I'm also interested in getting an IB middle year program in the Verina district in the future. So put that on, the, on your radar for the future. Um, so I have a, a few questions for you. Can you share with me uh, a little bit more about the approach that's used to reach uh, more culturally, um, linguistically, that's the best word, uh, diverse learners and their families about the program. So if you're looking at kind of some of those next steps to inform what's going on, let me give you just a real high level overview of some of the next steps that were not part of the presentation. Uh, Ms. Craver has done a fantastic job. She's got a two-page document that really just gives the high-level overview that you just got that was delivered to our three uh, principals earlier today. Uh, they're going to be calling meetings with their staff to kind of unpack some of those broader next steps and really just letting them know next year is nothing more than a planning year. I think that's important to restate. We really want to make sure that when we bring on that sixth grade group in 22-23, we have really listened to all of the various possible concerns or obstacles that could be in our way and also be able to unpack and share all the benefits of an IB program. Once that team has had a little bit of time to process that, we have a parent version that will be going out to the parents within those areas just as an awareness. We also have a site that we're very excited to be able to put out there where we're gonna to try to keep up to date and keep our parents informed as we move through our timelines. And we shared that with you all yesterday. So those are kind of some of those immediate next steps. 
Um, I know April also has some stakeholder meetings that will be taking place later in the spring into the early summer for our parents in these various locations um, so they can come ask some, some additional questions and we can gather some additional feedback. I'm still writing. One moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the other question I have is, well, before I get to that, the thought that I had was we know that there is trauma taking place from the pandemic. And so as we think about the reach and the timeline, I just want to make sure we, we consider that uh, and, and have real discussions around that when we're trying to reach uh, diversity, et cetera. The qu other question I have is, can you share with me what tools are being used to examine curriculum instruction and assessment? What comes to mind for me uh, in trying to get beyond uh, the reach that we have now is something like a rigor relevance framework where the quadrants are, are, are defined and we spoke about that. Can you share with me what tools are we using to get there? Sure. I, Ms. Craver, I'm going to go ahead and let you go ahead and share with what you do with your coordinators. Thank you. So one of the wonderful pieces about IB programs is that we are a program and it is international, so there's a global approach to it. And the IB organization has created um, guidelines for how to develop units of inquiry with a lot of uh, support behind those and even assessment tools that we can use to evaluate how those are being developed and to offer supports and strengthen where our teachers may need a little more assistance um, to allow them to collaborate with each other and um, really generate novel ideas in those units. Um, and we also, every, every year, we send off some of our work to the IBO to actually be evaluated and get their direct feedback on our units from our teachers. Um, and we've been doing that over the past five years at least um, to make sure that we are working with all of our subject areas and all of our teachers to um, help them continue to grow the program. Um, we also have IB coordinators at each school who teach part-time and who coordinate with the IB um, faculty the rest of the time. And they are involved in helping with the PLCs, the professional learning communities, to write units, to um, give them assistance on the, the different pieces and elements of those unit planners, to help them create their assessments, um, and just provide that guidance and support that is sometimes needed. So they are our IB experts in each building. And so what you share, that's what we've been doing for the past five years, correct? Yes. What tools are we going to use to get beyond what we're receiving now? And those are some of the things that we're exploring for this planning year to see what we can do. We certainly are looking at um, increases in professional learning. We want to invest in our teachers because that's an investment in our students. We are um, hoping to bring in IB, train, uh, IB trainings to our teachers in this virtual setting. We have some new options for helping them, um, whereas there, there once upon a time had to be a trip away for our teachers to be able to get that training. Now IB will come to us uh, virtually or even in person. Um, and we are going to continue to work with them to, to put that into place. We're also working with each of the county specialists in their curriculum areas to help with that curriculum development and writing from a, a variety of lenses so that the IB components are right there. And then as far as we go um, forward with that, um, we also want to look at other tools that are at our uh, disposal to be able to, to give that feedback and to help those teachers have the time and, um, and the expertise to continue to develop the pieces. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I hear you, and I know that there's more work to be done. Uh, this is a space of uncharted territory in many, many ways. And so perhaps HCPS has an opportunity to lead here uh, because I am not aware of any tools that are available. So I was very curious uh, to what you may have discovered, or perhaps this is the opportunity to create it. And, and I have confidence that, that you guys will get there. So please keep me keep me posted with that. I do have another question for you. Has the team begun a, a study or any assessment to determine if students in advanced programs in the eastern part of Henrico are experiencing less rigor around curriculum and instruction than in other parts of, of Henrico County? 
We do not have any official study going, so to speak, but what we have been doing over this past year is really taking a look at what we were calling an instructional framework. It should look the same, whether it be in a pre-K classroom all the way up to a 12th grade classroom. And that is how we go ahead and design and deliver and assess the curriculum. And as Ms. Craver earlier mentioned, the, the, the collaboration with her coordinators, department chairs, and especially the administrators within those buildings, being able to bring county frameworks and documents that we're working on and be able to merge those with the IB ones is really going to help strengthen that curriculum and especially the fidelity with it so that our programs that are at Henrico High School would look the same as the IB program programs at Tucker Ho, uh, for the, or, I'm sorry, Tucker mm -hmm. for those particular um, courseworks. Yeah, this is an interesting space because that PD is significant in getting there, right? Correct. But in order to get the PD or that professional development, there is curriculum that's not written in this space that I'm aware of. So in working with IB and, and their organization and what they've written, again, coming off of maybe some trauma, trying to figure out what we've done in the five years has gotten us here, but I'm not so sure it's gonna get us there. And so that's the second piece of trying to figure out the reach. And then the third piece is exactly what you've shared, which is you know, how do we get to a place where the instruction that's being given is equal in each area? It's not, we know that. Um, I think we could get to a place where we can memorialize it. Let's get to a place where it's documented so that we kind of understand that. And when we understand that, I think we could provide some, some maybe great solutions for it. Uh, and so this is complicated, but not too complicated that we can't achieve it. And so I'm really excited with the work you're doing. I'd really want to be a part of, not in the meetings, but some sort of summary. <laughs> really want to, to better understand this space. I'm intrigued by it, having kids that have gone through it. Um, I, I'm interested in how we walk this uncharted territory because it really is if we're trying to really get beyond what we've done the past five years. So thank you so much for your presentation. Mrs. Shea. Thanks, Ms. Atkins, Reverend Cooper. Thank you, Mr. DeSalt and Ms. Cravers. I wanna say that I um, was a part of the process dealing with the middle years um, program five-year evaluation so I did get an opportunity to spend a little bit more time becoming more intimate with our um, our process and so I, I appreciate that opportunity also um, I was excited uh, to work with uh, Miss Castile Rose at Henrico High School to ensure that our career related program um, could be implemented at Henrico High and I know how happy she is about the opportunity to expand access and to bring forth a different paradigm um, in the IB program. So I just wanna kinda say thank you to you two for um, your leadership and stewardship of the program. Um, just quickly for um, clarity purposes, to speak to the um, planning guide for student, students and parents in regards to our three middle schools, Fairfield, Moody, and Tuckahoe. And how do the class offerings, or the, how does the class offerings or program differentiate between the three as far as what's available and what we offer. Can you just kind of shed light on that? Absolutely. Um, another wonderful feature of IB is that they um, have a balanced curriculum, a very liberal arts-based curriculum that involves eight different subject areas that the students matric matriculate through each year. Um, this includes the arts, language and literature, which is English classes, individuals and societies, which is social studies, um, your, your world languages or language acquisition, your uh, physical and health education, a design class that's uniquely um, created for the MYP students. Um, and with all of those together, the students take them all each year and have that very balanced approach to their learning. And so our classes are offered so that students have an opportunity to do something in each of those subject areas every year of the program, even beyond the eighth grade. Uh, so at, at our schools, there may be a few classes in the electives or something like that that are a little bit different for, for that particular school, but they all have those components of visual arts and performing arts, um, the design, as I mentioned, those world language options that are out there for, uh, for us, it's French and Spanish. So the students do have those, those chances to take the classes, and in fact, it's built into their schedule, and they get to um, experience those annually. 
So it's very easily discernible the difference between the core and the electives. So how do we determine what electives are offered at the schools? I mean, is there a certain you know um, process we use to determine that? In terms of IB, and then I'm going to also ask Mr. Dussault to, to to chime in with this one. But in terms of IB, um, you know, making sure that we do have those courses for the arts and for design and for our world languages is the key part. Okay. But because it's an international program, they provide us with the flexibility to make those choices. And at the school level, Mr. Dussault. And that's a great lead into where we started this discussion was with um, Ms. Parker, our director of school counseling, and Dr. Dia Champ, our middle school um, docile director. That's where we began the brainstorming in terms of laying out an effective timeline, what would be needed, and the, and the coursework is going to be a big component of that, which is why we wanted to leave ourselves a long enough runway to do it well. Um, so we look forward to bringing back updates on that as we move along. So I appreciate that because it says that we are conscious and cognizant of the fact that we need to have kind of more of an equitable um, um, distribution of those electives because we are aware of the core courses that everyone takes. So that's a great segue to my next question um, on slide 13. Uh, you know, anytime these pr uh, presentations are given, that, 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 that slide always hurts me. Um, and, and, and I know that we don't gloss over, we do acknowledge, right? But when we talk about acknowledgement, I, you know, I just want to always emphasize, you know, action. As you stated, Mr. Salt, we, we, we begin with the end in mind. So um, for me, when we talk about those next steps, can you just kind of high level right now, because I want more detail later in what we're going to be, how intentional are we going to be to ensure that more is being done to improve diversity and inclusion. I mean, if you look at um, access for uh, black students, Hispanic English learners, economically disadvantaged students, and students with disabilities, I mean, the disproportionate you know, enrollment and, 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 and numbers that, that pertain to discipline, access to AP, IB, it's, it's a common thread. And I know Dr. Cashwell always jumps in on that because she is totally cognizant of that. And I just want to emphasize that is something that we do not just gloss over, but we acknowledge and we have intentional, um, actionable items that we're trying to implement. So please just kind of help me oh, high level because I want more later because I know that you're in the development stages, but just speak to that if you could. No, that's a, that's a great question right there. And, and I think we got a small glimpse of that this year with just the IB process. You know, the, the lack of having an NWA assessment for us to be able to unpack what the demographics will look like just from that one variable alone is a starting point. And then I think this also bleeds into the gifted presentation coming up next, our specialty center applications. Do we really have the right criteria in place, number one, that we're not being gatekeepers in any way, shape, or form? And then the other piece, too, is kind of what we had just the other night. Uh, and I don't know if anyone was able to attend Henrico High School's uh, fourth and fifth grade almost uh, advanced coursework planning drive-through, uh, where we uh, hope to have maybe 60 or so folks, and we ended up needing Henrico County Police um, for the almost 300 plus cars that came through. So having Ms. Craver and, and Ms. Conley to be able to get to those parents early, mm -hmm. inform them of what the opportunities are, why these opportunities are important for your child, and to see that type of almost reaction from our community and it was a very diverse group that came out so we know we need to do more of that mm -hmm. and we talked about it a couple months ago when i came here we've got to get the word out there earlier so i think in looking at our evaluation system getting the word out there and then of course continual conversation with our stakeholders is the only way that we're going to start to really move this rock up the hill well, I appreciate that. I look forward to, you know, further the furthering discussion and, and intentionality in regards to us identifying those issues and coming up with those actionable items. So thank you, Mr. Salt, Ms. Craven, Ms. Shea. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Ogburn, do you have any questions or comments? Trying to give some wait time here for the delay. Mrs. Shea, could you repeat? I didn't hear the last thing. I think you asked if it was my turn. It is your turn. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, I, 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 in that delay period, I, I, I lost you. But anyway, I, I did want to um, ask a couple of things. Um, Mr. Dussault, you just said um, a few minutes ago, do we have the right criteria in place? 
And so I wanted to, to, if you could just tell us what that, what are you looking at there? What are the criteria now? What are you thinking about change? What needs to change? So that's a great question, Ms. Ibrahim. I'm going to bring up Ms. Craver to kind of give you a level set of what the current criteria is. Hi, Ms. Ogburn. This is Ms. Craver. I am um, you know, really interested in how the application process has been working and what, what that, uh, the omission of the NWEA this year um, means for our students and, and um, their, their, their acceptance rates and so forth, and also how that would apply in a new situation and will we continue um, with the process that's been in place. And so we have been um, using this year in, a, in an adjustment, we looked at the students' grades, um, information from their teachers, as well as um, a writing prompt. And those three pieces together were all weighted equally and available for our students to um, be able to apply. And they are scored based on their, their or they are accepted based on their um, overall score on those pieces. I, I appreciate that. And one of the things I think it, is so great about this is, is that we are expanding opportunities. We talk about this all, all the time, that we want to be sure that our students all across the county have equal opportunities. And, and so to me, this is amazing work that you're doing, and I really appreciate it. I, I love the idea of growing the pie. Um, my last question is we, we, we're expanding the middle years program, and, and we're looking at Henrico High School. What possibilities do we have of expanding the high school options and opening it up more for our kids? We're really excited about those opportunities as well. And so um, as it has done in the past, Henrico High School is taking the lead on opening a new program for, the Hen uh, for Henrico's IB programs. Um, and then should that go successfully as we anticipate it will, they are in great shape for this, then we would like to consider something similar, if not the same for Tucker High School. Um, and then using other opportunities right on campus to be able to offer students opportunities in our classes for the IB program. Mr. Dusalt has a little more. Yeah, and I would just add on to that, that, you know, I'm glad, Ms. Ogburn, you, you kind of hooked into our growing the pie because really we're, we're not taking services away from any student. We're adding services. You know, there is a lot of student potential out there, and, and we've got to find better ways to capture it. We've got to have the ability, whether it be IB, specialty centers, AP, you name it, those advanced coursework options, we need to have task force that take a look at what are the current criteria and is it meeting the need? And we know by the data, it's not right now. So IB will follow some of the same protocols that our gifted program will in looking at the selection process to make sure we're capturing that potential. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to Ms. Shea. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Ms. Kinsella? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. I, you know, I think slide eight, I just need a better understanding um, at the very bottom of slide eight. Benefits all learners. Is that currently what IB is doing or is it what we hope for it to do in the future? Because it currently does not benefit all learners that I'm aware of. So are you, are you asking of the current program or potential I, programs? I, and, and maybe I can add some context here. Uh, you know, I think the idea is that the IB curriculum, as it's written, isn't intended to benefit all types of learners, okay. right? So learners that bring various strengths to the table. We all know that um, every student has different strengths areas uh, that they may lead in with learning. And so the idea is the IB framework is designed to benefit all kinds of learners. And so, you know, you're right in that IB is only offered to those who apply and are accepted right. to it. Um, but I think that the idea is when we think about expanding um, opportunities within a school, you'll often hear folks say, well, IB is not made so all kids can succeed. It's only for those who maybe achieve at a certain academic level. Okay. And IB will tell you, no, that isn't true. Our programs aren't designed only for students who can um, succeed uh, or who are currently achieving at high levels. So it sort of goes to that, making sure that we're understanding that there's a lot of potential out there um, and how can students benefit from that. And then we also saw, you know, between uh, the MYP program, then the, the 
um, IB program, the DP, and then we see the other piece that's being added at Henrico High School um, uh, around CP. And so the, the idea that there isn't only one pathway, oftentimes people think of DP when they think about IB, and there are specific things about that program that do meet the needs of some learners better than others, but that's not all that IB can offer. So by growing what we do offer in IB, that allows more learners an opportunity to come in and benefit from that. Okay, so thank you for, for explaining that because to me, currently it's, it's not as inclusive, um, it's more an exclusive uh, program. Um, this is a lot to process, especially when, when this board knows that, you know, we're proactively planning um, with all of our programs and, and looking at budgeting and capacity issues. Um, one thing for me with, with IB that when I sat in the meetings, as each of us did, um, to, to understand the interview process we just went through was, was how similar it is really to the HLP, as you mentioned in your presentation. Um, it, it, when, I look at, when I look at this, I continue, and I, I know that Moody was one of the first places where we, we brought the middle years program. Um, I'm very interested in hearing more about if we're gonna expand the program um, what is going to happen to my zone student? What happens to the zone students at each of the middle schools? What happens to those students? Where do they go? That's then a part of redistricting. Because I could, I mean, so all of, all of Moody, for example, is going to suddenly become IB in the future. M may I offer some context Please. to that? Because I, I think this is a, a point that, <coughs> probably worth some discussion because as you're wondering this, I imagine those listening are as well. So when we talk about expanding to a whole school model, what I want to be clear is that doesn't take away the application based um, core at, for example, let's use Moody Middle School, right? So when we talk about expanding it, that means there will be other opportunities for students who are currently zoned there to tap into the IB program. So it feels less like a program within a school, but there are common threads of that IB program that run through the whole school. But there are still specific components that are for those who have applied. It's simply that all students who are zoned to attend now also benefit from that. Okay, so it's more to access an opportunity. Correct, and okay. so it wouldn't mean that it becomes a full application-based uh, scenario. It would mean that that program still exists, but based on the various ways you can implement IB, and again, you pointed out we implemented many, many years ago, and what you see more frequently now as IB schools come on board is that a whole school model is used. And this is very much, um, something where we have an opportunity to see how it's done uh, all across the nation and the world because uh, we're probably more unusual than usual in the aspect that we still use this idea of a program within a school. And that's, that's not um, often how IB is implemented anymore. In fact, I know uh, many of their recommendations that come around things like access and opportunity are about how do you, again, uh, grow that pie, uh, but again, not remove that, that specific opportunity that still exists for the application-based program. Thank you, thank you for uh, providing some clarity. You knew exactly where I was going, perhaps, um, with folks who may be listening or watching um, the meeting, thinking about what was gonna happen to um, Moody Middle School in, in particular. Um, I'm very pleased, I appreciate Reverend Cooper's uh, questions about the opportunities, uh, better explanation of you know, are, how are the opportunities similar or is there equal access at each school? Um, so I do appreciate um, those answers to those questions. Um, when I look at the slide on page 14, um, I see that Moody has 23 different elementary schools feeding up. Tuckahoe only has six, and Fairfield has 16, which leads me to one of the biggest concerns I've had despite um, the extraordinary leadership I have um, at Moody Middle School. Um, the, one of our biggest issues there is sense of community. Well, when you have 23 different elementary schools feeding your program, um, can you talk to me about, about that and how we expect that to change? 
and whereas all of um, Tuckahoe middle schools, IB, feeder, elementary schools, it's only six, and they're all from the Tuckahoe district, if I'm not mistaken. So that's, that to me is a little bit exclusive um, in the world we're talking about now um, of um, inclusivity and access and opportunity. So if you could talk to me specifically about Moody and then um, perhaps what we may be doing um, for Tuckahoe. So that's a great question, and I know we've had some initial conversations together um, uh, earlier. I do think it's important to point out that there is a historical context to it, so a lot of it was what we had available at that time with seats, with staffing, and then I think it's also important to point out the, as you correct, there are 20-some um, schools that make up Moody, but if we look at the data a little bit clearer, you know, four or five of those schools make up the majority of those um, seats at Moody. And then same thing for Tuckahoe. We're looking at primarily two schools that, that make up the majority of Tuckahoe. So I think as we go into this planning, you know, we have to look at where the seats are and where would be an equitable way to redistribute those throughout the county. Um, you know, I, I don't want to look in the crystal ball and say we're going to move every school everywhere because, you know, we've had enough change. But I do think we're going to need to get some stakeholder input into that and plan that well um, as part of our 22-23 year um, to make sure that we do have that equitable distribution and we don't have oversized schools at, at various, uh, at our three schools. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And that's all I have at, um, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Uh, Mr. Dussault and Ms. Craver, thank you for this presentation. I know uh, the three of us have had um, quite a few conversations about IB over the last year, digging into the details as um, there's been some uh, specific concerns in my district around it. Um, so um, I wanna start with just a couple broad and then uh, get, get a little more specific with the access. And so um, these aren't necessarily particular to IB, but I think they apply to IB, that when we look at any of our specialty programs or any of our more rigorous courses, and um, y'all are doing some of that review and retooling in the next year, I think it's so important for us to make sure that the work associated with this programs aren't just more work, but they're different kinds of work. Um, and so, um, and then also, you know, as we have students um, in these programs, particularly our middle school and high school programs, um, how can we continue to focus them on the learning and not be hyper-focused on the grades? Um, and I think, um, you know, as we look at retooling this and um, really growing lifelong learners who are passionate about the learning, you know, how can we, and that's, that's a hard thing to do. Um, I taught um, at Freeman, I taught a lot of students that came out of um, the Moody IB program. This was before the Tuckahoe IB program existed, but a lot of students who came out of IB, you know, and I, I, I saw that firsthand. Um, and so as Mr. Dussault said, we wanna um, really capture and grow student potential. And so as we do that, um, how to focus on, on, on that piece and not necessarily the assessment piece. Um, for our students, I think that will um, have long-term benefits. Um, I would love to see the equity index. Um, so you gave us the equity index compiled of honors, AP, IB, and gifted, I think. I would love to see that equity index um, up for each of our IB schools um, with the um, schools that feed into it. And I'm happy to, you know, I, if you give me the raw data dump, I can generate it, or if it's easier for you to generate it. Um, but I think that will tell more of the story for us for IB. Um, getting a little more specific in terms of access, um, really jumping off of what Ms. Kinsella says, I know um, Mr. Dussault and Ms. Craver, we've had these conversations before, but um, would y'all mind scrolling to um, slide number 14? for me, let's see, let's see. I don't have numbers down here, so I'm oh, sorry. It's the, um, it's the middle school application trends. It's a beautiful graph, yes, there we go. Okay, so uh, when I look at that slide, um, two things jump out at me. One of the ones is the one Ms. Kinsella pointed out in which um, these numbers are not the exact numbers on the slide, but if you process it, it says that tw 20 um, out of zone elementary schools go into Moody, 
11 out of zone elementary schools go into Fairfield and zero out of zone elementary schools go into Tuckahoe Middle School. And that's a really big concern for me. Um, when we look at ensuring that access to programming across the county looks the same, this is not the same. And so as we look, I'm really interested on how we're gonna balance those seats, how we're going to fix that while it might not be um, the same number of feeder elementary schools in all three programs, it, I think we can get it a little more even than it is now between zero and, and 20, if you will. Um, and so um, I think that's an important conversation. I also, when I look at um, the, the um, admission rates of those, and so I'm making a little bit of a generalization by just going off a fraction as to um, admission rates and, and trying to glean from that on, you know, compet competitivity, I don't know if that's a word, um, of the applications. But um, Fairfield has a 45% admission rate, Moody has a 38% admission rate, and Tuckahoe has a 50% admission rate. So those numbers would suggest to me that Tuckahoe in some ways would be the least competitive and it has the least number of schools feeding into those 100 seats. So. I think when we put those pieces together, I think we can see a bigger picture of, you know, how we can provide some more balance there. Um, those numbers are gonna be really important to us as our, and me specifically for my district when we look at redistricting um, and, and middle schools. Um, and so um, I'll be really interested to hear how that's progressing, um, what our projections are before we launch into, um, revisiting comprehensive redistricting in the fall. That's gonna um, significantly affect my district. Um, and so I wanna make sure um, that when we do this, we're doing it right. And also when we redistrict, we're doing it right. Um, so, um, and then I wanted to ask just a little bit about um, Tucker. Um, so if you go one more slide down, we've got 100 seats at Hemrico. Um, with 250 applications. We have 50 seats at Tucker with 275 applications. So that's a 40% acceptance rate at Henrico or enrollment rate at Henrico and a 18 at Tucker. So we have this big, beautiful new Tucker um, with a lot more with, I'm not gonna say a lot more capacity, it's the same capacity, but significant capacity to fill. Um, from where we are now. And so, you know, if we're only at an 18% acceptance rate there, it would seem at first blush that there is interest there to grow the number of seats at Tucker, which would also help um, fill that capacity in a meaningful way. So I'm just um, throwing that out there from um, putting the pieces together. Um, and then one question, um, has it been considered to allow, um, to approach the middle years admission like the high school program admission and allow application um, to any program regardless of geography? So that's a great question. We have not considered that as a part of the early planning stages of a project plan, uh, but that is something that we could definitely bring back and discuss. You know, I think there's a lot of benefits to having it close, you know, geographically close to your home school, if you will, um, but it would also naturally um, alleviate some of the um, elementary feeder school inequity that we looked at. So I'm um, just throwing that out there as uh, part the of suggestion. the conversation. <laughs> all right, um, that is all I have. Any more comments or questions from the board on IB? All right. All right, I'll let Mr. Dusalt catch his breath because I know he's got another uh, large presentation ahead. So again, appreciate your um, detailed questions and inquiries and follow-up related to this update we've provided you and IB. You see we've got a, a journey ahead of us, a number of facets uh, to explore, and we'll look forward to keeping the board up to date and uh, bringing back answers to the questions um, you've surfaced here that we haven't <coughs> provided answers for. So the next presentation um, also gives us an opportunity to take a deep dive uh, into another specialty area, this, this time related to our 
gifted programming, and it has a number of layers to it. Again, so we appreciate your patience and attention with a sort of a meaty presentation here, but really thought it was important to provide to you not just an update on gifted, but sort of where we are related to the gifted audit we engaged in, some feedback we've gotten from the VDOE on our local gifted plan, and how we're addressing and continuing to address disproportionality as called out in our strategic plan. So there are a number of layers here, um, and Mr. Dussault's going to go ahead and begin that presentation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon once again, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. Here with me today is Ms. Jenna Conley, Gifted Specialist. Together we'll present to the board an overview of the HCPS gifted programming and our most recent gifted equity audit. Let's begin with the various presentation topics that will help shape the story of where we currently are and where we need to go. We'll start with a brief overview of the programs, unpack our equity audit of 2020, review how the gifted local plan anchors us in procedures and policy, and lastly, share specific actions that will lead us to systematic change. While we have taken time this year to appreciate the foundational changes within our programming we've made, we understand there's much work to be done if we're gonna reach the desired outcomes embedded in Destination 2025. Before we can discuss any specific actions to meet our goals, we'd like to start with an overview of how Henrico is charged by the Virginia Department of Education with the development of gifted services and programming options within our county. The Virginia Department of Education provides guidance to all school divisions regarding gifted education. State regulations require divisions to screen, refer, identify, and serve gifted students in at least one of the following, gifted intellectual aptitude or specific academic aptitude. School divisions may choose to identify and serve gifted students in career and technical aptitude or visual or performing arts aptitude or both at their discretion. We in turn take the gifted state regulations and align them to Henrico's strategic plan and the creation of our HCPS gifted local plan. These practices and policies ultimately become our roadmap for success. Our current gifted local plan identifies students in general intellectual aptitude and specific academic aptitude in English arts and math in grades K through 12, along with visual and performing arts in grades nine through 12. Gifted programming in Henrico County includes direct service for students in grades K through eight through resource services and zone center programs at the elementary level and through talented and gifted elective courses offered in middle school. Secondary gifted programming includes application-based programming through the Gifted Young Scholars Academy at Wilder Middle School, as well as visual and performing arts services through the Center for Arts at Henrico High School. Secondary students may also choose to apply and participate in the seven residential governor school programs in 10th and 11th grade, along with our various IB and specialty centers. One final option is the Maggie Walker Governor School, which is a program that hosts 180 students, given comprehensive educational opportunities that advance gifted students' understanding of the world and cultures around them. All good plans are rooted in data, reflection, and ongoing feedback. To help connect the dots for actions down the road, we must first take a closer look at what student data is showing us within the gifted services and programming in Henrico. We think it's important to remind our stakeholders who the students are that comprise our beautifully diverse school district. Our team is continually charged to reflect on who makes up the faces of this graph to help drive the work towards proportionality in our gifted programs. This reference point and subsequent baseline data is crucial as we work towards intentional changes and ultimately where we need to go in the future. Here you see a specific breakdown of our gifted students by subgroups. 
When you reflect back to our previous district level demographic slide and review the equity indices above, there is that clear indication. We have work to do. Our focus must be to improve identification at a higher rate within our African American, Hispanic, English learners, and students with disabilities who are currently below the target line. Reviewing the number of referred, identified, and specific locations of our gifted students was one of many key factors in our plans to set up a gifted equity audit in the fall of 2020. Let's take a deeper dive into the report generated for the district. Concerns about disproportionality in overall identified gifted student demographics led our department to commission an equity audit of gifted programs in the fall of 2020. The Office of Teaching, Learning, and Innovation, along with support from the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Opportunity, conducted an independent audit with our elementary gifted identification process and overall equity of services. We intentionally invited a wide spectrum of stakeholders who could help capture and articulate our areas for growth. Participants ranged from parents who reached out or who were disenfranchised by our programming or identification process to those who may bring historical context or experiences to our program. The HCPS gifted audit was completed by Dr. Jonathan Plucker, Stanley Endowed Professor of Talent Development at John Hopkins University and President of the National Association for Gifted Children. This audit included interviews of 28 stakeholders, including directors, administrators, teachers, gifted staff, gifted education advisory committee members, parents, and school board members. In an effort to get a complete picture of elementary gifted identification and programming, Dr. Plupker analyzed Henrico's policies and processes, as well as annual reporting data from our own Department of Assessment, Research, and Evaluation Department and not to mention feedback from the Virginia Department of Education. Dr. Plucker mentioned commendations across stakeholder groups that there is a strong sense that HCPS programming, when firing on all cylinders, is good and even better than opportunities offered in surrounding school divisions. While there's definitely room for improvement, a complete dismantling of the programming was not felt necessary. Another commendation noted in the report that gifted resource teachers are widely respected for the training and expertise they bring to each school. The range of diverse program offerings was also seen as a better alternative to the one-size-fits-all model for advancing learning and the use of universal multiple criteria identification systems were frequently mentioned as a strength by stakeholders interviewed. Dr. Plucker's report recommendations did cite a lack of similar lived experiences for the students residing in our five magisterial districts. He highlighted trends in Henrico County's student demographics, both racially and economic. These trends show Henrico becoming more and more diverse over time. Dr. Plucker analyzed student participation rates in our advanced programs that showed evidence of significant discrepancies between the overall HCPS student demographics and those receiving access to advanced services, which was confirmed on the previous slide regarding referrals and gifted identification. Dr. Plucker pointed out that the equity of instruction must be ensured across Henrico's 46 elementary buildings and suggested a comprehensive curriculum audit. Suggestions regarding Henrico's identification process revolved around Henrico's move to an OR approach, whereby student profiles could be considered more flexibly. For example, students could possibly meet three supporting criteria of five rather than four out of five in our current system. Requiring students to meet four out of five criteria tend to exclude African-American, Hispanic, multilingual, and twice exceptional learners. Additional report details highlighted barriers in the gifted identification for families who have to navigate the appeals process. 
He recommended reviewing and improving the appeals process to ensure equity and to remove barriers in the process. Dr. Plucker also encouraged Henrico to communicate to families the importance of advanced academic and gifted services to ensure our parents and guardians understand the opportunities that follow when students participate in advanced classes beyond elementary school. To facilitate increased and enhanced communication, Dr. Plucker suggested in his report that Henrico hire additional gifted resource teachers. Providing more gifted resource teachers would allow for more parent outreach, staff professional development for teachers, and on gifted education criteria. Front-loading, or the term talent development, efforts to support high achievement among dis in disadvantaged groups of students was a major emphasis, emphasis in the equity audit. Early intervention by educators to provide support and opportunities to students who otherwise would not have had them is the best strategy for achieving equity in advanced academic programs. Another recommendation was the utilization of local norms for test instruments used in the identification process rather than national norms. Dr. Plucker pointed out the use of local norms would significantly increase equity in the identification of students. Every child is gifted because every child is born with gifts. Upon reflecting of our current practices, policies, and audit came our theme, growing the pie. In order for Henrico to make significant and impactful changes to our gifted programs, we need to incorporate practices that extend and expand our current services, programming, and address inequities and disproportionality, rather than just simply redistributing services. So, the million dollar question is, how do we address all of the areas in need of growth cited in that audit in a cohesive way to ensure we can establish systemic policies and procedures moving forward? Analysis of state reporting data, DARE data, HCPS equity audit, and VDOE technical review information provided us with our starting point for intentional shifts in policies and practices. We are currently in the process of engaging our gifted staff, leadership, and school community to assist the drafting and rewriting of our gifted local plan, goals for 2021 through 2026, to ensure we address all of the goals in disproportionality towards destination 2025. To reach our intended outcomes, we are going to have to disrupt a gifted identification system that has traditionally underserved our African-American, Hispanic, English learners, and exceptional education students. Now is the time to refocus our efforts with guidelines and policies to make up the new local plan. Henrico's plan currently expires in 2021. The new plan will undergo a comprehensive review by our stakeholders and a rewrite of selected sections by our staff. To frame that work, Gifted programs will continue to align the work we began towards our strategic plan to ensure measurable goals and metrics are implemented through the five-year term of the new gifted local plan. The local plan for the education of gifted is Henrico's comprehensive plan. It's our guiding document for implementation of Virginia code, regulating gifted education, and addressing all aspects of services for gifted students. Henrico's current gifted plan was reviewed in the fall of 2020 and was part of Region 1's state technical review process. A team of administrators and educators from other regions across the Commonwealth reviewed the plan and just recently provided feedback to our department. The technical review team indicated levels of compliance with each component of the regulations. While there were many commendations throughout the 12 main sections of the plan, there were also recommendations that echoed our internal review of programming along with those of the equity audit findings. The creation of our 2021-26 local gifted plan, we are keeping an eye on the VDOE's report, Navigating Ed Equity, Virginia's Roadmap to Equity. 
This framework establishes education equity priorities and provides tools and resources to local divisions to dismantle inequity in Virginia's public education system, including advanced academic programs. The five keys to ensuring equity in gifted and advanced programs include identifying barriers, establishing goals, expand opportunities, expand eligibility, and finally, support student success. As mentioned earlier, our gifted team did not wait for the audit or the VDOE technical review feedback to begin our work on the foundations for the 2021-26 local gifted plan. Despite obstacles with virtual learning, staffing, data, our team has been setting the stage for success since the very start of this year. Let's take a moment to see how we've already started growing the pie in Henrico. gifted instruction one or two days a week. Another kind of piece to the puzzle for us is that talent development. Um, how can we ensure that all students who are curious have that nature of wanting to try something different, try something out of their comfort zone or out of the box, um, that they have access to it. And that's what we've been able to do with our choice board. Within each choice board, um, students are given the same lesson topics. So every choice board has puzzlers, wordplay, exploration, and field studies. But then, you know, those topics or activities change by grade level and, of course, by theme. They love choice, and we've been able to really kind of dive into what they like and make the choice boards bigger and better each month. So this year, our team worked um, diligently to develop response lessons. And what they do is they're there for the teachers, K through 5, to make sure that we highlight 21st century skills, creative, critical thinking, Within each response lesson, we worked through kind of a revision process to ensure that we were able to provide a detailed lesson plan. There's video descriptions. There's look fors for the teachers to kind of look for some advanced academic potential in their students, as well as different extension opportunities and products. Year, we have a lot to celebrate here at our GISA program at Wilder. GISA is the Gifted Young Scholars Academy. We really have focused on communication, communicating with our students as well as our families. There's always a parent who needs to help. There's a teacher that needs a question and answer, a student to talk to, and kids that are gifted see the world in such a different way. So we need to be able to support that. Gifted students do have unique needs. And one thing that's special about me is that I actually went to school uh, at the University of Richmond to receive my gifted endorsement so I could specifically address um, unique needs of gifted students. We really are seeking to grow the pie so that all students are receiving a level of gifted service in their classrooms. And growing the pie is a term that um, Dr. Jonathan Clumper, who um, conducted our equity audit, uses when he references really expanding your gifted services and advanced academic programming. And so that is something that we as a division are going to be looking really hard at and just making sure that we do have that cohesive programming in place for our students that need that challenge and that rigor. Anyone want to add something? This year, Clear and consistent communication has been one of our top priorities as we reach out to staff, parents, and community members with gifted programming information. A centrally organized messaging approach and platform has greatly improved outreach to our families. That partnered with a divisional timeline was the driving force in a noticeable decrease in the uh, number of missed program and service deadlines throughout the year. 
online parent FAQ documents, virtual information nights on gifted programming, bridge builder sessions, recorded videos, parent timelines are just a few of the things we have undertaken to support our families. And I would be remiss not to spotlight the endless personal phone calls, emails, and virtual meetings with parents who had questions for our staff and what they have done this year. Previously, Henrico had a patchwork of elementary gifted curricular resources that tended to vary from building to building. Our department recognized that we need to ensure equity and quality of instruction across all buildings. We began with an internal summer curriculum checklist aligned through our teaching, learning, and innovation department. The result of that exploration, a common curriculum template was designed for gifted instruction, which was reflective of our Henrico learner profile and deeper learning model. Rigorous thematic units by grade level were in turn coordinated and constructed by teams of elementary gifted resource teachers. During the summer of 2020, our GISA staff began the concept-based curriculum writing mission for our gifted middle school students. These cross-curricular units included best practice for gifted learners, unique content experiences, and real-world connections and discussions, along with the integration of social-emotional learning. Talent development focuses on developing students' specific areas of talent. It allows schools to cast a wider net and provide services to more students who have needs beyond the general curriculum. Part of the work we need to do as a staff and community is to re-examine our advanced academic pathways and consider new ways to reach students and build our talent pool. A pre-K talent development model is one potential way to add enrichment services to our youngest students to develop their academic identity and support our students who have that potential. A working group of Henrico educators and parents met last month as a focus group to discuss the possibilities of our pre-K enrichment. And we are currently planning for an expl exploratory launch in the fall of 2021 with a selection of classrooms. Our goal will be to expand these tal talent development options and services to additional pre-K classrooms in the coming years. Our video highlighted some of the phenomenal work our talent gifted resource teachers do and how they have engaged and challenged our students. On the slide, you see a small sampling of the monthly critical thinking choice boards, which provide those enrichment opportunities, not only for gifted students, but for all interested learners who want to participate and grow. Each activity is aligned to the attributes and skills in our HLP and provides the ability for feedback and overall usage rates. The beauty of the feedback loop we use is that students not only get to be creative and showcase their gifts with teachers, but the students also provide feedback to our curriculum writers on how best to enhance the activities in the future. These thematic activities offer a level of gifted surface for all interested students, which is something we have deliberately made available to all teachers seeking more for their students to help showcase that giftedness truly comes from a variety of students and populations. Response lessons were also a key feature in today's video clip. The premise of a response lesson is to elicit student responses to critical and creative thinking lesson activities. Lessons are once again for all students and may be taught by the classroom teacher, gifted resource teacher, or both in a co-teaching model. To better support early identification, there are detailed plans created for the teacher. These look-fors are targeted to showcase characteristics of underrepresented students, including economic disadvantaged, English learners, and twice exceptional students. We are extremely excited to use these lessons in the future as job-embedded coaching for our classroom teachers to help better understand and identify gifted traits in all types of students. Finally, as we head towards the summer, we have aligned our professional learning for gifted resource teachers with the book, Seeing and Serving Underserved Gifted Students. Educators will learn to recognize the strengths of underserved gifted learners 
and become more aware of their implicit biases and the effects on their teaching. Understand the academic, social-emotional needs of our underserved, gifted students. The foundational principles within the book are critical for the development of our local plan. So where do we go from here? Let's wrap up today's presentation with our intentional connections to Destination 2025. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, our team took on the challenge of why we have disproportionality within our gifted and advanced coursework straight on in the fall of 2020 by searching out and identifying a reliable audit process to gather additional information to confirm and drive our work. We can officially say this objective in our Destination 2025 plan has not only been initiated, but is well on its way to completion. Our work ahead calls for plans to address that disproportionality in Henrico. The gifted department began in that summer of 2020 by strategically aligning Amy's passport at that time as our division streamlined goals into Destination 2025 we refined our plans to narrow our focus on the intended driver. We strongly believe the success of our, strategic, our strategies, plans, and actions can only be measured by metrics. Our ultimate goal is to get our underrepresented groups closer to that baseline showed earlier in our presentation. In collaboration with our own Department of Assessment, Research, and Evaluation, and Dr. Jonathan Plucker, we shared minimum metrics for growth proportional to each subgroup of students in order to measure our success each year moving forward. As Dr. Plucker shared, it is very difficult to target the metrics the first few years of a program shift. While, we, while our hope is that we will see an increase in the identification numbers this year, our condensed gifted identification timeline, parallel hybrid instructional model, and other outside factors have made it difficult to determine a targeted metric for 2020-21. But despite those opticals, it does not diminish our drive to establish minimum yearly targets for success. And as we move forward, we will closely monitor that disproportionality, the success of our initiatives, and strategies for extending deeper learning experiences to all students. We look forward to returning here next year to share our results. So as our gifted plan undergoes construction, we, inv we are inviting representatives from our various stakeholder groups into the planning process as we engage with the work of our students to have access to advanced academic opportunities in Henrico County from our youngest learners on up. Growing the pie will allow more students to develop those gifts, gain access to services, and join pipelines towards those advanced coursework options. So you've heard a lot today of the who's of Henrico. Who is, who is referred for gift identification? Who is identified? And who is underrepresented or underserved? These are faces, gifts, and talents behind that data who are at the heart of our proposed HCPS Next Steps. At this time, Ms. Conley and I will now take any questions or comments on our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Dusalt. I think that jam-packed presentations back to back, uh, I tip my hat to you, but I, it's also a nod to all of the incredible work that the instruction team has been doing all year, um, and you've been a really big part of that heavy lift, so thank you. Um, I'll start to my right this time, Ms. Kinsella. Yes, I, I do appreciate both the presentations today, and um, it's especially for folks that are they're watching or they'll listen to the meeting back, and they'll see that um, equity really has been a focus um, of ours. And um, I know when this board has been presented equity data, those equity indices, I believe, since August of 2020. Um, that we all said from, from August to now, um, and I believe you started out with it, that there's still much work to be done, right? And I do know that we said that numerous times in the fall. Um, nothing is more, um, a few of the charts speak to me more than the one on slide nine, which actually is the equity indices and shows the uh, communities that we're not meeting. Um, 
But two, you know, when I look at slide, the slide on uh, slide eight, it shows our student population. Um, th this is not a new shift in our population. Um, we are a majority minority school division. So I'm very thankful for the two presentations we've received today that are focusing um, more on equity and specifically to serving the needs of all of our students. Um, I know in the Brooklyn District, for example, I have a gifted program in an elementary school, um, or I may have some classrooms that are specifically dedicated to teaching gifted students. But in some of my elementary schools, um, they're actually sharing teachers that we share with other schools. Can, I mean, are we going to, when I see resources and equity in this presentation, are we going to um, make access and opportunity um, more the same, if you will, um, in, in each of our elementary schools specifically? So if I'm understanding your, your question, so it can look a little bit different. So some of these schools you may be looking at may be self-contained um, zone center programs where they're with the same teacher all day long. If you're looking at um, you know, a teacher that might be in various buildings, that's one of our gifted resource teachers that deliver um, uh, their gifted services, so to speak. And then the third piece to that is kind of what we just began a few months ago, if I'm correct, Ms. Conley, the response lessons where we are actually bringing the gifted teacher not to just the gifted students, but the entire classroom to go through that rigorous experience with critical thinking and those response lessons, again, so that we can start looking for that giftedness. So I hope I answered your question. If not, then I can definitely follow up. Yeah, I actually would like a follow up because I wanna understand um, the sharing of a staff member between two or three elementary schools for gifted, ser for gifted services. Sure, so we have, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, 29 gifted resource teachers? Um, for, elementary, for elementary, we, are, we should be at about 18. We're down a couple staff members right now. So we do have several teachers, our elementary gifted resource teachers assigned to three and four buildings. Uh, most of them are more at a two school kind of threshold. And you know, one way that we do staffing in the summer prior to a school year is we look to see the numbers of identified students. And thinking about your question and thinking about equity, that's something that we're probably really gonna look very hard at this spring because what we see are some patterns of you know, schools where they may only be getting a day of gifted service those gifted resource teachers are spending their day serving those identified students and then next day off to another school. And so, you know, working to have um, a more of a role in a building where they have time to look for students and to be part of, you know, some of our general ed response lesson types of delivery, I think would really benefit and help. Um, but that's where we are right now currently. So definitely looking for next year, how we want to use staff um, creatively and, and maybe more equitably across the board. Yes, thank you so much. And then- Mrs. Kinsella, may yes. I add to that? Is I think this cool. is a really important question you've posed and, and something we also saw in the recommendations that came forward um, from the review of the programming was to look at expanding the number of gifted resource teachers. So I think, you know, based on the number we have, we, we look at where there are identified students and, you know, it's sort of like dividing your resources as best you can to serve student needs. But when we see uh, best practices, such as understanding that um, times when gifted resource teachers aren't just providing services to students who are identified, but to all students in the school um, as part of that uh, identification process and helping to recognize talent in all students, you know, we recognize that there we, we may need to look at some more resource uh, allocation there. And so um, obviously this is an intractable challenge when we look at school counselor ratios increasing in any number of specialized staff where we know having more staff uh, can help us achieve some of our outcomes. So it's certainly something to put on our radar for long-term planning, not just how we use the staff we have, but understanding that this is one area where having additional staff dedicated to this uh, specialty position can assist us in achieving our goals. Thank you for um, providing additional detail there. I had um, one more question and really it comes, um, you showed a slide with Maggie Walker on it. Um, and can you explain to me, is it true that Moody only has one Maggie Walker seat 
and Wilder only has one seat. And that typically is the is the Moody seat for Maggie Walker. Does that typically go to an IB student? And and are we addressing that? Is someone looking into it? That's a really good question. And there is, in fact, one assigned seat for every middle school. So you're correct in that. And so where we have our IB and GISA programs at those two sites, um, we do sometimes see that they go to a non-zoned student um, just by virtue of the way the phases of the selection process are carried out. Um, this year, we've looked really hard at exactly where everybody is feeding from. So we're even tracing it back to elementary schools and really trying to trace and understand, you know, what, where our students are coming from. But I will say, you know, we, we've only initially kind of gotten our, our selected and wait list um, kids notified and all of that. So we're sort of in a holding pattern while kids are accepting their spots but we do see great representation for Maggie Walker from Moody, including typically the one spot assigned to it. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just important that the questions be asked and answered and uh, to ensure that um, we are providing access and opportunity for all of our students, no matter where, no matter where you live in Henrico County, you have access to excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella, Ms. Ogburn. Thank you. I mean, all right. Uh, I want to just commend um, Mr. Dussault for the amazing work and for the team. Um, honestly, I've been the board rep to the Gifted Advisory Committee for a number of years, and we've talked about this work, and I'm just so glad to see that we have actual action steps. To me, that is such a, a step in the right direction. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to go back to, though, was the equity audit recommendation, um, was that equity of instruction must be ensured across all 46 elementary schools, and that's going to be followed up by curriculum audit. So if you could just give us some more information on what that curriculum audit is going to be like, because certainly we want that is the focus of this board to uh, be sure that there is equity of instruction across the, the elementary schools. So if you could just highlight where we're failing on that and, and how that audit will be done. So I'll jump in on the first part and I'll let Ms. Conley um, take the second part. So in the summer of, of 2020, the entire uh, division of learning, uh, primarily through the Teaching Learning Innovation Department, we took a look at a checklist of must-haves for quality unit construction uh, that took us through the design, deliver, and assess phase. And we also looked at the various components of CREM and SEL and what would really make a good unit. And so we took our pre-existing units and kind of took it down that checklist. And that checklist then kind of helped inform what we called at that time the practitioner's guide. So essentially, if you were a teacher to go ahead and design a unit, you knew you had to have these components and you needed to have some backgrounders about specifically what you would be doing when you're taking those components and constructing them to meet the needs of your students. We realized at the very beginning that we had some good resources in Gifted, but we really need to align that a little bit tighter. And I'll let Ms. Conley explain how they took the unit to the next level. Hi, Ms. Ogborn. Um, so we started off last summer um, with some training through our HCPSU with our gifted resource team so that they um, did get a module in um, our culturally responsive education model. Um, and that really kind of laid some groundwork for as we built our units, you know, drawing from sort of best practice in gifted ed, we looked to the National Association for Gifted Children's Standards. We do have gifted goals for our K-8 uh, gifted resource program. We also drew from the Henrico learner profile and SOL content as well to construct our framework. And so our teachers have worked really hard this year to construct uh, uniform units that are being delivered at every one of our 46 elementary schools. So if I'm a second grader um, and I'm at Highland Springs or if I'm a second grader over at Glen Allen, I'm doing the same unit with my gifted resource teacher. And so we're really striving for that uniform curriculum. Of course, you know, teachers are gonna put their own spin on things and have autonomy to personalize and, and do those kinds of things. But we, 
really want um, to ensure that we have rigorous curriculum across the board for all of our identified gifted students. And so um, I do envision that this summer we will again revisit and look at the, the units built to date and kind of audit through them and ensure that they are rigorous and also, you know, they may need some tweaking. We sort of did these in a virtual environment for the first half of the year. And so thinking toward how we use them next year is, is something we're gonna work toward. Okay, thank you for all of that. Um, I am um, really hopeful that as we go forward, we would really diversify our, our gifts and services. Like I said, this is something that we have talked about for years and I'm just so glad to see that we are really attacking it with action steps. And especially starting at an early age to let students know what's within their reach so, and what is possible for them give them the ability to reach their true potential. Um, and, and I think that is uh, the key to the work. So thank you for all that. I'll give it back to Ms. Shea. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn, Reverend Cooper. Thank you, Ms. Shea, again. Um, thank you both, Ms. Connolly and, and Mr. DeSalt, again, for the work, the tireless work that you put in. I really am appreciative, I'm sure, as we all are. Mr. DeSalt, again, <laughs> you like the sacrificial lamb day, but I appreciate you um, verbally and publicly declaring that we recognize um, disproportionality in our gifted program. So I appreciate that statement being said publicly because that's an acknowledgement. You can't um, address something unless you acknowledge it. And so the acknowledgement of it and this detailed plan that you have put forth says that we are very intentional in shifting the paradigm pertaining to our gifted program. And I am extremely excited that you have stated that you will ensure yearly targets for success once we roll this out. Um, you know, one of the things that perturbed me, and the word perturb is not a, a, is not a word, that's a bad word, so I, I didn't want to say it bad, but one of the things that perturbs me is when members of the community um, somehow make the statements um, that when we rethink how we admit students into our gifted programs to improve access and improve diversity, it impacts the rigor of the program or it quote unquote lowers the bar for students who have worked so hard to meet the current admission requirements. And as we focus on improving our gifted programs, I just feel that it's imperative and important that we have more opportunities to educate the community to help dispel and debunk this misunderstanding. Um, I support all the recommendations identified particularly around work that needs to be done to focus on early identification of students and how these students are identified. And one of the, the recommendations made was to increase the number of gifted resource teachers. I'm, I'm glad that uh, superintendent just made the statement about resource allocation and long-term planning because hopefully, Madam Superintendent, as we you know, develop our budget and we talk about those critical um, positions that are necessary, that this will necessarily be one of those that will be heightened hierarchically in our uh, plans. Because for me, the diverse makeup of our GRTs make a difference. We all know that the GRTs and those who, or individuals who are responsible for the identification process, that we need to have diverse individuals in these roles to be able to identify diverse students. Um, we need to culturally, we need to have, I'm sorry, culturally competent teachers and teachers trained on implicit bias to help with the identification. And so we want to make sure that we are targeting uh, HBCUs anywhere that we can find, you know, again, this overarching overall effort to um, recruit, retain, and reward teachers of diverse backgrounds that reflect and represent our entire student population, the, the rainbow of diversity that we have. Um, and so for me, as you develop this, I'm looking forward to the aggressive uh, plan that specifically identifies the intentional efforts to improve um, the gifted program, specifically in the East and Henrico. Um, since this was a common thread and common theme in the observation and recommendation uh, made by Dr. Plucker and his team, um, I'm sure we will be able to get the resource allocation again for this, but I'm just looking forward to, you know, the, the meat added to the bone. I'm appreciative of the public declaration that we recognize, we acknowledge, and we are seeking to uh, address the disproportionality that exists in our program and that we're gonna make sure every stone is unturned. So thank you so much. Look forward to hearing the updates. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Much of what I said 
after the first presentation applies to the second. Uh, so I won't revisit that, but I do have a few questions. I, I particularly appreciated the reflection of parent and staff experiences that was provided in the report. Oftentimes we look at numbers and reports and forget the story, because there's emotion with it. And with that emotion, that helps guide our trust. So even if we expand, there's a trust that we need to build to even send black, Indian, Asian, et cetera, that parents wanna feel comfortable sending their children so that no child feel like they're the only black child sitting in a class. So I hope we, we take note of that. What's gonna be extremely helpful in that, uh, Pastor Cooper just mentioned, having someone look like them, educate them. It's important. It's important to feel like you belong to a child and to an adult. So I, I'm in, in awe that you have had the carriage. This is not the first time you've said it, but I'm extremely proud of both of you because you are publicly acknowledging it and saying, I wanna fix it. And if we can't fix it, we'll start it. And so I'm very proud of you. Um, one question I have that, that I thought of in reading the reflection of the parents' experiences, um, where do we capture experiences? Is there a place where we capture experiences from students and staff and families and we can go back and look at all of these experiences and understand how our, how our families, our staff, and our students are actually feeling. Do we have anywhere where we capture that? I might offer uh, that uh, if you're thinking broadly or just related to gifted programming broadly, or in general. With our advanced okay, programs. I wanna make sure I didn't mm -hmm. misunderstand. Well, you know, one of the things uh, is our annual climate <laughs> survey and just might put a plug in since that window is open right now and I know how incredibly busy our staff and families and students are, but this is an opportunity for them to provide us uh, real insight into their experience. And so a number of the questions uh, on the survey are geared not just uh, towards specific academic related pieces, but to the experience uh, at large in, in relation to safety and wellness and all of those kinds of things. So um, that's one way we capture it. I think um, in some of the, the work that we've done Done to analyze very specific programs like we've seen here. I think that offers us a, an opportunity to go even deeper, Mrs. Atkins, because I think, you know, we know how important student voice and hearing from our stakeholders is. So I think we need to continue to do more of that as we take a deep dive, not, you know, of course, looking at all of Henrico, I think that that climate survey is one way to do that, but whenever we're reflecting uh, and analyzing um, specific elements of our program, I think we have opportunities to, to use a model like this that captures um, that, that uh, information. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Catchwell, because I see this similarly to how we assess our children. We don't use one test. I don't think we use one survey once a year. I think that in building trust, it just really starts with conversations. I also think when we think of equity, um, the, the survey is sent virtually, but there are many that don't have ready internet access all the time. So timing is important. You know, if you're a mom like me, where I have a job, but I'm also a school boy rep, sometimes I have a short window to use the internet. And so I hope that we are also considering different ways that we engage in conversation with families, with students, and with staff. So thank you for that. Um, the other question I have is, um, do we have a formalized equity policy? Because now that we're into the second deck, um, if we have one, I, I'm hoping to hear more of how we use our equity policy to guide us in our, our thought process and our decision-making process in both of these areas, IB and with our advanced and gifted programs. So I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in for a second here. We do not have an equity policy, so to speak, um, contained within the local plan. 
Um, what we do have is the criteria that we use for identification and the discussions that we're about to have with our various stakeholders is going to help determine what that looks like. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you talked about those, those conversations. And when I mentioned that Ms. Conley and her department, the countless phone calls and emails and the time that they have spent listening to parents um, that may be disenfranchised or confused or frustrated, that question of, of why, um, that why is what's helped driven our work and the changes that we plan to make and we will continue to make. Um, so while there's not a formal equity policy, so to speak, in regards to, to gifted or IB, um, the stories that are shared do help shape the work. Thank you so much. Dr. Cashwell, do we have a formal equity policy in general? Uh, if you're speaking in, in general to our policies, I think you might think of our, uh, that there are a number of pieces that cover equity as far as hiring practices, non-discrimination clauses. I'm not sure that I could generalize, but something that's specifically related, a policy that calls out equity. I can't think of one. Can you, I'm just asking legal counsel to be sure, I apologize for turning. Well, I was um, looking at legal yeah, too, because so, I was getting ready to turn yeah. to you and ask about that, because I think that's important as we have discussions mm -hmm. about equity. <laughs> We need an equity policy to help guide us as well, not just for curriculum and for HR, but how can we move the needle if we don't have a policy that's gonna outlive us? Not just for right now, but for the future. So I'd like to, to ask Dr. Cashville that we begin the process of figuring that out. Yes, certainly we'll share that feedback with our policy uh, committee and also would note that they do use uh, an equity framework in examining all of our policies. So there are some standards uh, of practice that are out there uh, in relation to making sure that as we review each and every policy, there's a standard um, equity uh, checklist that's used to examine, but uh, certainly we'll take that feedback. To yeah, I, I also think that what, there's so many benefits for a policy. As I'm listening here and, and listening to Mr. DeSalt and Ms. Conley and their efforts, some of our, their lives could be made easier if they just had a policy in place, period. I also think there's so many other areas that could be, we could have more engaging discussion if we had that as well. And it's also very hard to hold individuals accountable if there's no policy in place. So I, I look forward to learning more about that. Um, the last question I have is, can you share with me something that, that I've been reading about and you may not have an answer and that's just fine, but I've been reading trying to better educate myself for the future, for future careers that we don't even have titles for and colleges may not even have curriculum for, but in preparation for students, can you share with me your thoughts on the difference between gifted and high performing? And I know that's a tough question. It's, it's easy on the surface. You could Google it, but I'm really looking for a deeper understanding as we move into the future, particularly with technology. Sure. Um, well, I will say that, you know, we do oftentimes come across checklists that talk about, you know, what are the differences between a bright child and a gifted child? And that was, you know, a, a big thing for a while. And then I think they also threw in, you know, characteristics of the creative child. So we are always trying to kind of sort kids and to, to neat little circles sometimes. And honestly, I think if we approach it from, you know, if we have a bright child or a creative child, that has unmet needs that is not being challenged in the classroom, it's really not gonna matter whether they're identified gifted or not. You know, our, our onus and our, our burden as teachers is to make sure that we challenge those children regardless of whether they're bright, regardless of whether they have a gifted label or not. And so really I think that, you know, we wanna kind of develop that idea of how do we serve all of our students on some level? How do we challenge them? How do we give them that critical and creative learning experience at young ages so that we can really tune into that talent development model that we're striving for so that we have the spectrum of K-12 you know, enrichment and extension for our students that are in need of that challenge. And so you know, with, with the bright child kind of conundrum that we have, 
We need to meet their needs. We need to make sure that they experience differentiated learning. And so, you know, whether or not they have a gifted label, we're still going to make that happen. And, you know, our role as gifted resource teachers and some of our advanced, you know, course instructors, we all have to have that ability to differentiate the content for those students that need that high level of challenge. That's an interesting answer. I appreciate that. So then that takes you to what is a bright child, right? So I think um, I would like for us to maybe have some sort of round table. This is consideration, right? Just something to think about. But start to have conversation on the differences because families want to know what is the difference. So the terminology you use is bright child. Someone might consider that as meaning the same thing as high performing. So, mm -hmm. I, and I'm asking this not for the right now, but to prepare us for the future, particularly around careers around artificial intelligence and things like that. There's a certain persona which we know that comes with gifted. And so as we continue to move into that, that technological space and other spaces, even trade, let's start having a deeper conversation on the difference between what is gifted and what is high performance. In today's world, there is clear delineation between both. But as we continue to move forward, I'd like for us to define what that is. Not to create a barrier, but to provide knowledge to families so that as they prepare from kindergarten beyond, they can understand what it means. It's very difficult to kind of see beyond if you don't understand. So thank you for listening, and, and that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Um, I have a few questions. Um, first one, just quickly, I, Maggie Walker was on the one of our slides, and so just for clarification, is being gifted a requirement to apply to Maggie Walker? No, it's not. It does, um, you know, in their mission statement and some of their literature, they do use, you know, language about the school being, you know, sort of geared toward gifted students. Um, but you do not have to be gifted to apply or be accepted to Maggie Walker. Um, if you are selected in Henrico and you are not already identified as gifted, we do at that time um, assign a gifted tag to you. Got it. Okay, so just as we're looking at um, having conversations, broader conversations about access to our specialty programs, and we're also looking at access to gifted programming, um, I'm just trying to figure out how, how some of those fit together and if that's a box that needed to be checked. So thank you. Um, I will follow up with um, the top question I had follows directly with what Ms. Atkins said, and I think you've answered it, but I'll just um, reiterate. I think it's really important that we figure out how to delineate between gifted, bright and high achieving, and particularly in the elementary school, well-prepared and, mm -hmm. and well-supported. Um, that Venn diagram has a lot of overlap, but they're also three distinct different things. And so we wanna make sure all those students have, like you said, access to um, learning and curriculum that meets their needs and engages them. But all three of those pods also have different needs, right? And so, um, you know, just continuing to think about that and, and not necessarily as we, you know, in terms of tagging students, but in terms of making sure, like you said, all students are getting the type of instruction um, that grows them and is meaningful to them. Um, some other questions. Um, my understanding is this is typically a parent-initiated process. Can you explain why we use a parent-initiated process? Um, the Virginia Department of Education requires that we um, have the process. It can be initiated by a parent, by the student, even a community member or a teacher. So it's not just parent driven, although we do see a fair number of parent referrals. Um, I believe that next year we'll really kind of take a look at, you know, how, where there, our referrals are coming from, um, doing some analysis of that data. And that was, that was my follow-up. Oh. So I'm delighted to hear that. I'd love to hear um, that. I think we should look at um, really the ratio of for each school and each category mm -hmm. on our equity index of how many parents have um, requested the evaluation versus how many of those students are then referred to the program. And I think I, when we look at those ratios um, to compare both the, the different categories, but also the different parts of the county, I think that may help us um, 
the discrepancies there may help us identify some gaps um, and, and where those gaps initiate and why they're there. Um, you know, when I was looking at the equity index, um, you know, our economically disadvantaged students are underrepresented 70%, you mm-hmm. know, and that could be because their parents may be working multiple jobs and don't have the bandwidth for the advocacy necessary um, for a parent initiated process, right? Mm -hmm. Or our EL students are 99% underrepresented and perhaps that's the language barrier, not not of the student, but of of the family not knowing what's available and how that they um, kind of trigger that process. So um, I'm really interested to hear as y'all look in the referral process and um, dig into that. Um, Have we looked at um, more looking at these referral rates? Have we looked at the referral rates? And by referral rates, I don't mean referred to the program, but um, referred, you know, by the parent for interest for evaluation. So have we looked at those rates um, comparing the, the 14 schools that have in-house programs compared to the three um, zoned programs? I haven't looked specifically at those referral rates, but I did look into how many identified students we have at the school-based sites versus our zone center feeder schools Mm -hmm. that that go to our three zone centers. So I am currently analyzing that right now, Mache, and you know, definitely look to provide, you know, some more information on that as we dig into some of those, those demographics and the referral rates and all the, all of the data that we can kind of attribute to those school buildings to see where we may have some gaps. And, and to your point about, you know, maybe having some barriers to referrals, you know, I do think there's a lot of work we're going to need to do to make sure that our parents know how to refer you know, and what am I looking for through the parent lens? You know, how, how do I know if my, my child is gifted? I think um, part of the work my team will do will really be some parent information sessions as well as educating our staff too as far as those look fors um, in some of those other populations. Absolutely, I think those look fors are like super key for our um, teachers to when they're identifying not only the high achieving students, right, but some of our students who may not in the grade book be the top, but they really are exhibiting those gifted, thinking outside the box, putting pieces together in a new way. Um, Circling back to this um, question about um, in-house versus zone programs, um, the the reason I ask it looking at, so I I assume that when the in-house programs were chosen, it's essentially a numbers, right? If they have enough, when they were initiated, if they have enough students who would comprise a gifted class, then they have a gifted class. So just a little bit of historical yeah. context. When, when Henrico made that move, um, the, the thought process behind that was getting um, gifted students into larger clusters um, to be able to, to have like peers and drive that. That's when the decisions were made probably, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago. Um, There were a number of also uh, other factors that played into this, the idea that um, you had students that were leaving their home schools all across the county, and you were having friendships broken up. You were having, you know, parents having to struggle with a fourth grader who's losing their best friend. So we looked at varieties of ways to keep larger percentages of these gifted groups within their home school community for that culture and climate to remain intact. And then schools that did not have enough of a population to have a a cluster, so to speak, that is how those zone centers really came into play. Absolutely. So, so when I so when I look at that and I think about it through the elementary parent lens, right, and in terms of whether I want my child to be evaluated for gifted, because I mean the COGA, it, it's a significant testing process, and so you know I wonder if having a zoned excuse me, an in-house program versus having to leave for a zone um, plays into how many parents decide to have their child referred. Because, you know, if you're not in it, if you don't have an in-house program, you're looking at 30 minutes of services a week. And while I'm not um, discounting the impact of gifted te- resource teachers, because they're awesome, and that is an awesome 30 minutes that those students look forward to all week. But the the impact of that compared to a self-contained all day, every day gifted, it's very different. And so 
um, it's almost like a cost benefit analysis for the parents. Well, if they're only gonna get 30 minutes, it might not be worth doing the referral, where, where if they're gonna get this self-contained class, well, that might be worth a referral because leaving, just as Mr. Dussault po pointed out, leaving your home school to go to a zone, that's a significant sacrifice. And so I wonder if we're almost creating this self-propagating cycle um, that we continue to have more referrals at students, at schools that have in-house because they have in-house, which, you know, so really looking at how that might impact, particularly for our elementary schools. Um, and then um, two more things quickly. Um, as you all look at, dive into the data, you know I love me some data. Um, looking at if we have any data on how access to early education impacts referral rates or impacts participation. Um, in the gifted program. And um, as we expand our pre-K um, access, looking at how that might um, change, change some of these numbers and change some of these numbers for the better. Um, and then lastly, um, are, are there gonna be input sessions um, that parents and um, teachers broadly, not just like identify gifted teachers can participate um, during this evaluation process? So yeah, that's a great question. So obviously we're starting with our GEC um, on April the 1st, where we're gonna lay out our plan for gathering that specific feedback and how community members can be a part of that. Um, we also are very excited to be sharing, now that you all have had time to kind of review our, our sites to kind of help inform parents for our work in 2021, um, Ms. Kindly and I have kind of discussed uh, the ability for parents to give feedback through that, which we'll be working on. Um, and then I do think we're gonna have to get out and about, you know, much like we did on Tuesday and, and get to where our parents are. So um, we have a short runway. We know we would like to be back here in front of you by June, um, sharing our local plans so that we can have that ready to go. Again, we're kind of at different timetables dictated by the Virginia Department of Education, um, but we do always have the ability to provide amendments if need be. So we've got our work cut out for us for the next few months, but we're up to the task. Absolutely, that is a short runway. I just bring that up because we had our um, school board listening session last night on equity and we had 20 some um, speakers and at least two or three of them specifically mentioned access to gifted programs. And some of them were um, parents and community members and some of them were teachers that aren't gifted specific teachers, but they see these trends in middle school or high school in terms of um, courses students are in and um, that sort of thing. And so I, I think it would be really beneficial um, you know, to open it up, not necessarily to people that we identify to hear their opinion, but people who would like to share their opinion. And I know that creates some extra bandwidth on your um, short runway, but, I, but there seems to be a lot of community interest um, in sharing their um, experiences with that. So that concludes um, my comments. Anything else from the board? All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dussault and Ms. Conley. Thank you. Dr. Cashwell. Thank you. All right, for the next item, uh, you all may know that March is Youth Art Month. It's also uh, Music in Our Schools Month. And so we've been doing an awful lot uh, to recognize and celebrate that. I hope if you're not following Henrico Schools Art on Instagram, you are, because you get to see an awful lot of student artwork featured there. You know we have it featured in our building on a rotating uh, basis. And of course, um, highlighting our, our music, uh, musical talents of our students as well. And hopefully the virtual world has offered us an opportunity to see more musical performances uh, in creative ways that our students have put on uh, than normal. But this moment is about recognizing um, our art educators and music, music educators uh, of the year from Henrico County Public Schools. So Dr. Hughes has a short presentation uh, to share with you information about those um, educators who will be honored. And thank you, Dr. Cashwell. So good afternoon, Chair Ogburn, members of the school board, and Dr. Cashwell. Uh, this afternoon, I would like to take just a moment, as Dr. Cashwell said, to recognize virtually the art and music educators of the year. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, the teachers being recognized this afternoon exemplify the qualities that make a master teachers. They're dedicated, creative, innovative and proactive team members whose love for children and education show through in their daily work. This year's winner for the Elementary Art Teacher of the Year is April Barlett from Greenwood Elementary. Her principal, Ryan Stein, shared the following about April. Mrs. Barlett exudes what she hopes to create. She leads with love and instills a passion for learning for all the Gators. 
Throughout the pandemic, Mrs. Barlett has seen no barriers and has found a way to bring her classroom alive through take-home art kits, digital resources, art challenges, and morning art clubs. With her leadership and contagious enthusiasm, our students have become go-getters, decision makers, designers, creators, self-starters, entrepreneurs, and dreamers. So congratulations to Mrs. Barlett. <laughs> The Art Middle School Educator of the Year is Mae Burgless from Moody Middle School. Denise Doss, principal of Moody Middle, says this about May. May joined the Raider family in 2016 and has been a great addition to the staff. She is always trying to help students learn to appreciate the process of creating, learning, and designing projects. She believes that learning to love learning is an important skill for students to take into the world. So congratulations to Mae Burgless. The High School Art Teacher of the Year is Beth Jones from Freeman High School. Beth's Associate Principal, Richard Butler, had this to share about Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones is considered to be part of the bricks at Freeman High School. She is truly part of the foundation that holds the Freeman family together on a regular basis. Beth is a master relationship builder with her students and colleagues and demonstrates the importance of connecting with others on a daily basis. Her colleagues view her as a role model and an instructional leader, admiring her and benefiting from the work she has put into virtual and hybrid teaching. Most importantly, Beth's students recognize her as someone who cares deeply for them on a personal level. Congratulations, Ms. Jones. Okay, and finally, give Ms. Burton a, just a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Lastly, we recognize our music educator of the year. Morgan Day has been the Henrico High School Director of Choral Activities since the fall of 2007 and teaches the Level 3 Music Theater class and the Show Choir classes. Mr. Day was selected by Richmond Magazine's 2017 Best and Worst Edition as the best choral director in Richmond, Virginia. In addition to teaching at Henrico High School and the Center for the Arts, Mr. Day is a music director and mentor for the Character Works Theater and also the Minister of Music at North Run Baptist Church. Congratulations, Mr. Day. And also congratulations to all the Fine Art Educators of the Year. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Hughes. It was wonderful to be able to celebrate uh, those talented individuals and, and their contributions to Henrico County Schools. And just as a teaser for our audience and board members, we'll um, be bringing you a student musical performance next month and hope to feature some student music um, at the, the um, board meetings in April, May, and June. So something to look forward to as we continue to celebrate music in our schools. Our next um, item I'm really excited to bring to you, uh, board members, this afternoon is we have, uh, and, and Mr. Pritchard's going to tee it up for us, but really excited to have a student from Deep Run CIT program here present her capstone project to the board. Uh, so uh, we are really pleased to have her. She was incredibly patient through our entire meeting. I know she uh, has really gotten uh, an earful and a special taste of what a board meeting's like. I know part of her capstone experience was to really have an authentic uh, presentation to the board based on the ideas she presented, but she really got a taste of an authentic school board meeting. So more than she may have bargained for here, but Mr. Pritchard, I'll let you introduce our guest presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. It is my pleasure to introduce Erica Linton, a deep run senior in the CIT program. Erica is here today to share her CIT capstone project, a traveling tutoring bus. I would also like to acknowledge Principal Dr. Brian Fellows is here and CIT Director Lynn Norris for being here for, for support. Thank you guys very much. No HVAC systems today, no buses. This is great stuff, so here you go. Hello, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. My name is Erica Linton, um, and as Lenny Pritchard introduced me, I'm a senior at Deep Run High School in the CIT, and this is my capstone proposal. Um, a capstone project is a year-long project in the CIT where we choose a, pro um, a subject that is important to us and we 
make a project around it, whether it be a documentary or, in my case, this proposal. Um, so first off, the digital divide um, is the gap between those who have easy, quick ex access to the internet and those who do not. And within Henrico County, this divide has begun to worsen over the last few years. Specifically in 2019, it was found that 15% of Henrico students do not have access to the internet or electronics, such as laptops or tablets. While this year, Henrico County has distributed around 3,000 personal hotspot devices, with virtual learning, it's obviously been a challenge for many students to access um, the resources that they need to get the education that they deserve. And thus, I believe that this year, um, my proposal would be extremely helpful. My solution to this gap in resource accessibility is to create a modern bookmobile, um, which would be a mobile tutoring experience that would allow students specifically elementary students, opportunities to learn in a tailored tutoring environment, which would address um, loss of learning and provide them with exposure to STEM. The overview of my project is that it would involve a converted bus, and this bus would go to community or recreation centers in Henrico County two days a week for one hour at a time, and students would be able to be signed up by their teachers or parents. Um, for example, if a student is struggling with uh, fractions, students, sorry, teachers could sign their students up for the Fraction Math Monday, and the other day would pr be focused probably on science. Um, the two goals of my project are to assist elementary students learning through flexible tutoring opportunities, which would allow them to ex access tutoring um, and get flexible help with subjects that they may be struggling with. And another goal is to provide elementary students with more potential access to resources. Um, I was hoping to have students have a potential of two hours of access per week, um, of additional access per week, um, through laptops, the internet, or tablets which would allow them to become more familiar with these and then allow them to um, invest in their education more. In my proposal, there is a formal timeline. Um, this timeline would go from June to January of any kind of year. Um, and I specifically spoke with Mr. Mac Beaton, who I know has converted two buses for Henrico County. And he told me that a bus typically takes around six months to convert. Um, and my specific timeline has um, potential vendors and potential dates involved. Um, and within my proposal, I also had a budget which details around $37,000 of total cost with $20,000 for general modifications and $17,000 for additional equipment. However, I, am, I believe that Henrico County will soon be phasing out the high school laptops, and so there is the potential to reduce the cost of the additional equipment by keeping those laptops and using them on this bus. Here I have a sample schedule of what could be used to, um, of when the buses could go to specific recreation centers. While I think that this project would mostly focus on the east end where internet access is scarcer, um, it could still make trips out to other recreation centers, more towards the West End. And as I detailed earlier, there would be specific subject days, such as math and science, with um, focused tutoring on specific things in math and science. Um, I think that's all that I have for the board. Are there any questions? Ms. Linton. Terrific job. Thank, Thank you. you so much for um, sharing this that great idea. Um, I'll throw it over to my board members. Is it your turn to start? It's Ms. Atkins' turn to start. Okay, <laughs> Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Thank you so much for your solution-oriented presentation. It's incredible that you've done your research to understand the dynamics of each of the areas to make sure that your impact is great by choosing the areas that have the most need. 
and then you went beyond that. Um, and I was, I was quite pleased uh, just to let you know the Springs just recently became the Springs. And so I was really pleased that you paid attention to those little small details instead of using the older name, which is where it's still listed in other places. So I uh, just wanted to point that out, that, that your attention to detail is, is wonderful. I also would love a copy of your presentation to share uh, as well. And I think that um, I'm delighted that you noticed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Reverend Cooper. Well, you know, they, they say a lot of persons have an issue with public speaking, but I think you did a phenomenal job. I'm very well composed and articulate and very expressive in your presentation. So I was thoroughly uh, impressed and enjoyable. So continue the good luck, continue the great work and good luck in your further endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Ms. Ogburn. Ms. Ogburn, it's your turn. Oh, Ms. Ogburn, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, thank yeah, you. Um, I just wanted to say how impressed I am with the detail of your project, and I, I feel sure, I don't know what your future plans are, but I'm sure that they're bright and, and will be something we'll all want to be watching. But I, I do hope that you will continue to push this project. I'm sure that um, this is going to create a great number of conversations for us and as we go forward, and I would, um, I would just hope that we can work together to make this happen. I, I think it's an awesome idea serving uh, the needs of our kids, which is what our school system is all about. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Ackburn. Ms. Gonzala. Again, more praise for you. I couldn't, I, I, your topic couldn't have been more relevant, um, nor, nor your, I mean, your solution as well. Um, echo everyone's comments, uh, especially Ms. Ogburn's about, um, I, I hope we see it come to fruition. I mean, it, I mean, just bravo for your work. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gonzala. Again, Ms. Linton, terrific job. Um, I really appreciated the data that you brought around um, that the digital divide is um, increasing in our county, um, and that was surprising to me. I know Ms. Atkins routinely shares the challenges of internet access in the Verina district um, due to their geography, essentially, and so um, I think this is a um, unique approach, which I um, commend you on, and I love that it's focused around science and math. Um, we have our really great libraries in this county, which are great um, access points for literacy, but having those um, math resources and you know hands-on science opportunities um, just warmed my heart. Did you know that five-thirds of people have trouble with fractions? <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. That's, that, that was my joke for the day. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's all I have. Um, again, thank you. This is such a joy for us to get to um, see, see a student and hear their presentation, uh, particularly this year when um, we haven't been able to be with students the way we usually like to. So thank you so much for not only putting this proposal together, but taking time to share it with us and waiting through the whole meeting and just kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I want to echo, I want to echo the high praise and, and let everyone know, including our board members, she actually went through the authentic board process, even with a pre-board presentation to all of DLT. So uh, she's done just as uh, any DLT member would in bringing a presentation forward. And she did so in a masterful manner. So we've also, of course, uh, got our wheels turning a bit, particularly as we have Big Blue uh, as a bus and some other buses that, you know, as we've mentioned, we've retrofitted for other purposes. So lots of potential co to connect ideas and better meet student needs. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, for our next item, I am recommending that the school board approve the water line easement between the county school board of Henrico County, Virginia and the county of Henrico, Virginia at Pemberton Elementary. Is there a motion to approve the easement at Pemberton Elementary? So moved. Moved by Ms. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The easement is approved. 
Thank you. Members of the board, the next items um, I have for you are consent items, and so they uh, can be taken in a block. I am requesting approval of the following, acceptance of the monthly financial statement and budgetary status report for the month ending February 28, 2021, acceptance of the monthly financial statement for school nutrition services for the month ending February 28, 2021, and approval of personnel items. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent items as listed? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Reverend Cooper? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries. The items are approved. Thank you. And that concludes any items uh, from me this, this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell um, and your team. The next item on the agenda is public forum. This is a time where citizens um, are invited to address the school board on any matter of concern about the school district. There are two modes today for public comment, in person and written comment. The board has received a copy of all written comments submitted by the community, and it is posted publicly in board docs as well. We appreciate citizens who took time to send their comments to the board, and we have reviewed those written comments. For in-person comments, citizens have signed up in advance. Speakers will be given two minutes to address the school board. We will follow the sign-up list, and the board will not hear from any speakers who have not signed up in advance. Those who have signed up to speak may not relinquish their spot to someone else. We ask that each speaker come to the microphone and clearly state your name and neighborhood or school affiliation. To assist you in tracking your time, there is a timekeeping device on the platform of the stage. Speakers will have two, a two minute time limit. The light will be green as you begin your remarks. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining and we ask that you please stop speaking when the light turns red. The school is here today to hear from you, the community. Speakers should speak directly to the board we will not be responding to speakers today. We appreciate your attendance here this afternoon and for providing your input. I've been provided with a list of speakers that have signed up. Our first speaker is Mr. Robert Layton. Mr. Layton, there's a mic right back there right where you were. I 
think that we could work toward developing exhibits. We could work toward a museum, markers, a film, a statue, a number of different approaches. And I would be happy to spend a lot of time with you in that endeavor. I provided paper to extend these remarks. And I would invite you to look at the area of the exhibit on what has been chronicled in the archives. It makes a better case that I can. Thank you so much, Mr. Layton. And I wanted to confirm that we have received um, the document you provided both in written and electronic form to review. So thank you so much. Our next speaker um, that has signed up is Ms. Monica Hutchinson. All right, we will move to our next speaker, um, Ms. Faye Polaris. And our final speaker, Michelle Carulli. As our final three um, speakers do not seem to be present, um, that concludes um, public forum. Next on our agenda is the approval of minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins. Roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Reverend Cooper. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Osborne. Ms. Osborne, do you have a vote on the minutes? I vote aye. The minutes are approved. Um, un, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Um, board members, do you have any unfinished business? All right. The next item on the agenda is new business. Do we have any new business? All right. The final item on the agenda is announcements. Do, do any of board members have announcements to share? Okay, uh, I'll share um, an announcement that um, Ms. Kinsella and I got to celebrate our nursing students on Tuesday evening at a live in-person graduation. Um, and hopefully the first of many in-person graduation celebrations this year, 24 students graduated as LPNs. This program requires significant focus and dedication in any year but especially during a global pandemic working in the healthcare setting. Congratulations to these 24 students, our newest nurses. Um, yay! Um, if we have no other announcements, I will close with announcing our next meeting date. We will not be meeting during the week of spring break, so our next meeting is Thursday, April 22nd, here in Newbridge Auditorium. The start time of 2 o'clock may be adjusted as needed. Meeting is adjourned.